Here we go. And it says we're recording. So there we are. So I'm Vance Stevens. I'm in Penang, Malaysia right now. And um, I'm uh, one of the coordinators for EVO, Electronic Village Online. And we're right now we're doing EVO, the best of EVO 2020. EVO 2020 is what we would do in January and February. And we, uh, we have uh, Electronic Village Online sessions for five weeks at, on those months. Oh, hang on a minute. I got people I need to let into the, there's this Mike Kent, Contreras here. Do you know him, Mike? Yeah, Contreras? yeah, he's a very good friend. Okay, someone from Israel and in Hebrew. It's okay, no problem. Okay, so, um, all right, so good. Well, Mike is here. Yeah. Uh, anybody is welcome at this Hi. point to. Hey. Hi, Mike. Hi. Hi. How are you doing? Hi, Matina. Hi. <laughs> Mike, I've been calling you Mike Kinteris, but it must be Kinteris. Yeah. It's Kinteris, yeah. Ah, uh, Kinteris. Okay. I mean, putting the Greek thing together. Okay. That's cool. <laughs> All right. So anyway, well, good to see both of you here. And I was ex explaining to uh, Matina that I, yep. that this is EVO, Electronic Village Online. What we're doing is we're kind of replacing the uh, sessions that we, we go online from the TESOL conference in Denver, but that's been canceled because of COVID, which we're all staying home for. What a sad situation. But anyway, here we are, happy situation. We're here together. And um, so uh, let me just show you what's going to happen tonight. But Matina is actually quite a strong member of TESOL Greece ah, for many years. Okay. I've only been around you know, briefly for the last three or so. Uh -huh. She's yeah. been around quite a bit yeah, and supporting yeah. herself. Yeah. Just... And I've uh, actually uh, been a member of the board as well. Been a tea seller since 1989. And wow. um, I served uh, on the board for four years. So, yeah, been to IATL mm -hmm. as well. I met Nelly in person, Nelly Deutsch. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, I've known her for some time. Yeah, I'm sure <laughs> quite you, a bit. <laughs> sure you have. <laughs> Let me see if I can, what do we have? Oh, this is it. This is what I'm looking for right here. Um, I don't know, do I want to present this? Okay, why not? This is our introduction. You know, what we try to do is we, the, ooh, there's some booming going on. I guess, that, oh, two people in the waiting room. Let me just take care of them. Michael Birch, I think we saw him this morning. Jane is here. Okay, excellent. I'm not sure what that bang is. Is one of you doing any banging or let me just see if anybody else is. No, it looks like it could be from, it doesn't really matter. It's just that if, if it's from you, it's okay. But if it's from somebody else, we want to mute them. But I don't want to mute you because you were talking to you. Hi, Jane. How are you? Hi. Hi, Mike, Jane. Good. Mike is here and Matina is Mike. here. Both Hi, Mike. Hi, Jane. Hi. And I guess you can probably see my screen share. I was just, what have I got here? This is, oh yeah, this is the one we're doing right now. This okay. is uh, our schedule for Saturday. Let's see, oh, Sue Anand is here. Okay, let me just admit her into the room. Wow. Bill is here, all right, here we go. Okay, oh, you know what, that, that must be in my Minecraft, the banging, could be creepers going off. Not sure what's going on there. Oh. That's, that's probably what it is. Okay, anyway, we are in uh, part three of three of the three part webcastathon, web which we're doing today and yesterday, and we're in the last part of it. And today we're going to hear from Heike Philp about immersive language learning, and from Jane and I, and Heike perhaps, uh, about uh, EVO Minecraft MOOC. And then uh, looks like Kirsten and Katrine and Marina. Is that you? No, Marina, Matina, not, not okay. And Virginia are going to uh, talk to us about English for the workplace. And we're going to have something about flipped learning with Martha, Jeff, Diana, Carolina, and Gabriella, and Mike Contreras. Yeah. Oh. And Diana, yeah. Oh, here we go. Yeah. Getting exciting. Yeah. And then Nagla Salim is going to talk to us about grammar for TESOL. All this scheduled to sort of go on a not so tight schedule. I don't know. You know, we could also go overtime. We're not that uh, 
we're not that pressed really, but you know, I suppose if we're going to finish in a couple of hours, we need to keep everyone down to 20, 25 minutes. And especially we want to have time for questions. It's always nice to have questions at the end. Okay, so that's, that's basically what we're going to do today. And let's see, if, uh, let me get the, uh, the thing on that. That's what we are. We're best of EVO online, uh, not canceled, but moved online. Um, I have a question. Yes. The, uh, I, I watched all two hours and 40 something minutes of the first session. Mm hmm. Oh, uh, which is quite interesting on YouTube. <laughs> what I'm about the second sure. session? The second session, that's, that was, uh, this morning. This morning. Yeah. Yes, that's right. We had two presenters. We, we actually had three scheduled, but, uh, somebody spaced and we had two and we had a very good conversation with them. It was also for two hours and, uh, uh, really, it was kind of a nice session, and it's it's all online. We, oh, that is online. Yeah, that that was the question. If that's online, because yeah. I couldn't find it in the morning. But let me just see if I can. How do I get out of here? If I stop the share, okay. Oh no, I, I could have shared you anyway. Just, yeah. Hi, Sue. How are you? Nice to see I'm you. Well, thanks. Good Hi, to see Marina. You. Yes, good. Okay. Uh, Sue is presenting later. And uh, I was just going to show uh, where these things are. Uh, so if I go back to that one, actually, it was the one I was sharing. Uh, let's see, maybe I need to, I'm not sure how I can get to the thing. Was I presenting? I guess I was presenting. Maybe I need to go and unpresent. Exit the presentation. There we go. Ah, there we are. Okay. Still sharing. And uh, what I wanted to go to was learningtogether.net. Learningtogether.net is where I'm putting all these things that are happening. And uh, I've got kind of a table of contents here. So you can see what we did yesterday. Um, that's the video from yesterday, which Mike watched all two and a half hours of it. Whew, what a trooper. Two hours and 47 minutes. Two hours and 47 minutes, oh, holding wow. our feet to the fire here. Okay, so well, this one's a little bit lighter. It's uh, maybe an hour and 45 minutes. I'm not really sure how long this one is. Anyway, this was from this morning. So we had uh, two presenters talking here. And let's go back up here and I come over to the one we're at now. This is the, uh, nothing there yet, wonder why. Ah, it's because we haven't done it yet. Okay, this is yeah. kind of like space balls, you know, we're sort of backing up and coming together. Are you guys familiar with space balls? No. Rings a bell, but yeah. It's a, a, a play on Star Wars, and there was some point in the, uh, in the spoof where there was some critical situation, and they wanted to wonder what to do. And they said, well, you know, all these movies are, um, they're all... Um, they're all bootlegged. So, oh, so they looked in their uh, the video collection and they found the movie they were in and they started playing that. And then they fast forwarded up to the point they were in and they said, ah, and then they all turned back and looked at the camera and they all, in the movie, it was doing that. So anyway, that's the thing, you know, that oh. is sort of a, sort of like a, um, the meaning of life, where there's one movie inside another. Another movie, yeah. Uh, anyway, what can I say? Okay, Joe McVeigh is here. I'm going to admit him. And Miyako is also here. We have 14 participants at the moment. So welcoming everybody. Uh, so anyway, this is just to, for the newcomers. This is where we are cataloging this. I think I'm going to have to turn off Minecraft. Or, uh, let's see how to turn that off for a minute. This is making booming sounds in my uh, computer. Okay, so um, this is learningtogether.net. And if you go there, just learningtogether.net, you'll find the, the videos that we're putting up online. The one that I'm making tonight, probably it's going to be, it's going to finish at midnight. So it'll be morning before I get it together and put it up on YouTube. But I will do that in the morning. Yeah. Anyway, let's see. Marina has just joined, and Kirsten, Kirsten from uh, 
uh, the uh, workplace Nagla is here. Okay, so Nag Nagla. All right, wonderful. Okay, so uh, Jane, I don't know what uh, Jane. What else do we have to say here? I I had the. Uh, I'll put the slides up. Okay. What else do we have to say? Uh, and I uh, maybe we could say what we're going to do today. Yeah. This is our schedule for today. Gonna have if if Heike is here if she's not here I don't know Jane I guess that would be us that's going or okay. whoever wants to go. I think and we're ready to go if Heike is not here. Yes, mm -hmm. I think we're ready to go if Heike is not here yet. Okay, well Heike is one of our moderators. Yeah. Okay, well give her a minute and okay. anyway, she's going to talk to us about immersive language learning, assuming mm -hmm. she comes, and then we're going to talk. Uh, Jane and I and Heike. Mm -hmm. uh, she must be here on the list. Yes, she is. Okay. And uh, Aaron Schwartz was in Minecraft a moment ago. Yep. So we have all these people ready to join us. So we're going to talk about that. And then English for the workplace. Uh, Kirsten is, is here. Nellie is here. Let me just let her in. Uh, okay. So uh, then we're going to have flipped learning, flipped learning, uh, a few of these people, I don't know, oh, Mike is here, Mike Contreras. Yep, they'll come, they'll be yep. here, Jeff will be yep. here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Martha. Yes, and, and Carolina. Nagla. Nagla is here now. Is, is Martha here? No, not yet. Okay, no, no he's got plenty he should of should be time. logging on, yeah. Yeah. Diana. Is Diana here? Not yet. Okay, but they'll right. be here. We were just on WhatsApp. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, so I guess our first presenter would be Heike. But if she's not here, I think Jane is suggesting that we just go ahead with it, shall we? All right. It's ten o'clock. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Do you think she's going to come soon? Well, I don't know. You know, we, we actually this afternoon we were waiting for a couple of presenters on one of the okay. sessions. But they never appeared, and never actually responded to any of us. I don't suppose Did they respond to you. We tried to email them. Um, I think Judy just got just um, got back. Uh -huh. and, okay. Yeah, said she thought it's tonight, eleven. Ah, well, it could be tonight. I mean, they could yeah. they could do it. You know, so. Okay, well, it's 10 o'clock now, and I guess okay. we'll try to keep ourselves at 20 minutes and try to, to keep a good, uh, to make a good model for other people. Okay, so we'll so, go first, right? All right, so let me see if I can, I'm in a screen share. Well, I don't know, what, what, what do you can, want? Do you want to put on I, mine? Can I, do, can I do my screen share? Do it, do it, okay. yeah, okay. This is EVO Minecraft MOOC. EVO Minecraft MOOC is not a session where we tell people what to do. What we do is we get them into Minecraft and then we show them how to play Minecraft, first of all. But that's actually just the fun part. And the really fun part is how to use it with students, how to use it in learning in these uh, uh, participatory cultures. So that's what we're actually trying to do is get people into the participatory cultures and um, Oh, cool. I'm probably in here somewhere. Yeah, the, yeah, that's uh, ZZ is mm -hmm. Aaron. Um, mm -hmm. He's, he hosts our server mm -hmm. from the University of Ohio, or, Ohio, 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 University. right. Mm -hmm. Ohio University. And uh -huh. this is Tricky from Taipei. Um, that's Emmanuel from Brazil. And uh, this Maddie Tai is my son from Taipei. All right, there he's doing crazy stuff. Um, well, always does crazy come, stuff. Yeah, it's his and, mother. <laughs> okay, um, so this is my like um, right here. We started um, EVO Minecraft MOOC uh, before I joined. It's 2015 to 2019 on Google Plus, and we had 391 members, but Google Plus. Uh, closed down and so this year we moved our community in several places uh, 
on Facebook, the one on Facebook, uh, we just set it up this year and we have 44 members because it's a new community this year. We are also on Discord. This is how we communicate, stay connected with the EVO Minecraft MOOC educators from all around the world and Carol hey. Post. Yeah, yeah, Discord is a, uh, it's a, a voice chat, which is very popular with gamers. And it also has this, it's quite like Slack, don't you think? Mm -hmm. It looks a lot like Slack. Yep. But and, it's, it's a place where you, you can actually, it's, it's much used to go in voice online. So we get to a game like Minecraft where you, you can't speak to each other. You can, type, you can text chat, but it's really nice to have a voice component and this one is well suited to gamers uh -huh. yep so it's where we communicate and mm -hmm. carol posting um in an adventure in world posting what they did on hallowell server that's, um, we that's also, the way it's like slack you can also uh sorry to interrupt but you can also uh anybody else wants to interrupt and ask questions please do uh but uh anyway we can as you can see we can post uh pictures of what we do and it's very communicative. It's kind of like Google Plus in that respect. You can uh, discourse about your activities. Okay, go ahead, Jane. Okay, and we're also on groups.io this year, just newly set up. Um, yeah, these are the three different places we communicate. Um, okay, to, to share a couple of slides, um, I came across this uh, player type uh, four different player types uh, on Facebook um, bet show. It's a live streaming. Um, and we have com compete, collaborate, express, and explore. And this is what I found interesting because um, like we have different preferences. And um, in the following, I will be showing you some of the uh, pictures taken in Minecraft and if if you um, if you will um, please try to guess like um, which type of player you know players or you know uh, um, we are like you know compete is it compete or is it collaborate or is it express or explore um, in the tech text chat okay um, so this year, uh, 2020, we started off uh, here at our spawn point and with Dakota giving us a, a tour around the server. Um, here's Heike. Um, and and um, so right here we have Michio, she's from Japan and we came together and um, had fun with her water slide this is her house she built a house but she had a water slide um, and we had fun okay so next is um, Abu Fletcher uh, Don Carroll and he's always uh, you know asking let's go for a run something like that so um, guess what type of like what what type of player he is um, um, so explore, like, I guess. yeah, explore. <laughs> we have an explorer in in our community, and he, um, um, Vance and uh, Don always takes us out on a hike in 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 Minecraft. And look at this view. This is um, at the end of the day. Uh, I took a picture of him um, in this magnificent magnificent view. Um, this is Dakota. He and I, um, he helped me build my house. And so guess what Dakota, like what type of player he is? Um, what are the choices? Compete, collaborate, express, and explore. I'd say collaborate. Collaborate, yeah, he's a collaborator, but um, he's also express? like ex express it. Yeah, mm -hmm. for express, it's like uh, he likes to build and design and mm -hmm. express like, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, also next is, um, this is Hallowell server. Dakota built all this. This is uh, Hallowell University and this is Tricky and I and Ava. So you can see that he's an ex he's uh, express. He likes to build things. Um, um, this is Maha's uh, house on Hallowell server. Maha. 
he's also she's she's also um she she's the she's the one who helped us set up discord server and and facebook community and help organize this year's event um thank her very much this is maha olive tree also um, setting up a scavenger hunt for us if we step on this plate then um we're greeted with a um and told what to do she's in a number of virtual worlds she really likes the like the uh, was it called um world of warcraft and things like that so she's mm -hmm. in into uh, and second life and she really likes virtual worlds mm -hmm. so it's nice to have these collections of people here who have a wider perspective yep and we had some fun being attacked by skeletons it was you know and also what about this um we're attacked by this uh, spawner the skeletons so that's me with the arrows yeah we're we're actually collaborating and killing the <laughs> skeletons we had to find the spawner by accident and then once we found it we had to suppress it and then uh I got, we got to the point where we could it spawns skeletons and the skeletons shoot arrows at you and you can, if you kill the, spe the skeletons, because if you're there where they're spawning, you can kill them and then you can collect their arrows. It's a really good way to get lots of arrows. They're hard to get in Minecraft. Yep. Okay, and this is, um, uh, uh, this is Gangster Rito from Israel and he's uh, in, in junior, senior high school. He joined us um, and this, Maddie built this parkour um, challenge and he was trying it out so and this is Maddie um, hosting a splee uh, activity or game for players on the server and he teleported everybody here onto the server and played splee so we have this tool and all we what we need to do is to um, get rid of this uh, what's it called the, the snow plate um, and for people to fall off the, this platform. Whoever stays uh, ah. there wins. So you see Olive and people so you falling off the high place. You fall through it. <laughs> so guess what type of um, player Maddie is? He's the fifth kind. <laughs> okay, let's see. Um, com competitor, yes, yes. Yes, uh, he likes to compete. Um, and this is the wool race that he, Maddie built for us. And um, he built three rounds of wool race. Um, and we had to collect wools and he's got a point system where the dark, darker wools would, uh, 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 we would get more points off of those. And, and um, it's not easy. He likes like competition and look in the end there's lightning striking so we were uh, it was like life-threatening event for us um, not suitable for adults I think <laughs> um, uh, you know there, there's a link to that uh, one of us should find it and put it in the zoom chat yeah yeah so we were we were really trying to tell each other where did. to stand and not to be uh, strike right by how old is Matty? 11 years old he's 11 yeah. years old and when we started out we had mariana and philip uh philip was 11 years old and he was also one of our gurus and he that was in 2015 so he pretty much taught me and some other people how to play minecraft uh so these are really great models 11 year old kids uh, who are, so that i suppose they brought jane into this and uh and, and mariana also so uh, this is really a nice learning environment because you know uh you have to have despite the trouble Maddie causes we <laughs> really respect him for the the things he creates in there and that, that's really they're really amazing so I, yeah, thank I hope you we... thank you for tolerating Maddie, <laughs> and he's learned yeah, a lot from our from... community yes <laughs> he's learned a lot um mm -hmm. from being we learn from community. these kids. This is the really wonderful. Yeah, I didn't know anything about Minecraft when I started in 2015, and 
I just started it up uh, so that I could get people to teach me. And that succeeded beyond my wildest dreams. So I actually know something about Minecraft. Certainly not as much as people like Maddie do, or but we're all learning bit by bit, you know, and we're learning from each other. And this is the 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 key to EVO Minecraft MOOC and also to EVO to some respect, mm -hmm. to some extent. Okay. Thank mm -hmm. yes. Um so we celebrated uh with the fireworks he created, uh with Dakota being uh uh, the uh, the first, okay. Um, and back to language learning. So uh, Maddie is actually a, a, a second language learner or, or foreign language learner of English. And um, by participating in the community, he's he's grown so much. Um, for this year, he's he 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 um, he told me that he wanted to post like today from. Now on every day, I will post something uh, about Minecraft and he started writing and eventually I, I had, um, I, you know, I had a domain name for him on uh, WordPress and he's blogging all his gameplay. Um, and um, I think that's a really good start. Um, so. so basically what he's doing in Minecraft, he's articulating in English. Mm -hmm. Okay, we don't have our last page. So I guess we're going to go into, um, I guess we're going to go into Minecraft, shall we? Sure, why not? Let's see, I, I might try to get there myself. Um, we're sharing your screen, so let's see, somewhere in here there should be a Mm. Windows thing with a, there we go. It's not. Oh, I must have killed Minecraft. Okay. Okay. It's not it's working well. It's lagging. Timed out. ZZ is still in there. Mm hmm. So we're where were we in Minecraft? By the way, I noticed it was a it's flat. Where, screen. It was a flat. Wool ra that's the wool race that uh, Maddie created for uh -huh. us. Okay. Okay, that's Maddie. Ah, there is Maddie. Okay, hi Maddie. Come on. Boy, come on. Okay. 不要再笑了。I'm, I'm just... Um, perhaps I should stop share screening. Yes. Okay, I could, uh, I could try to share mine if I can actually get to it. Mm -hmm. uh, or you could try it again. You could try sharing again. Okay. Let's see, I'm, I'm trying to connect to Minecraft myself. Could be overloading our resources. There we go. I think I've got it now. Uh, I'm going to join the server. Okay. Uh, if I succeed, do you want me to share or do you want to do it yourself? Sometimes things just get a little slow. Uh, I can show you what I'm doing. Okay, this is what, this is where I am right now. I'm trying to log in and it's not doing it. So I don't know if that's a, uh, it's, it's, it's quite a lot of system resource where, oh, timed out. Uh oh, okay. I'm going to stop the share. Okay. No, oh, I don't know. Um, maybe we could just talk about it. Either that or open up the 115 server. Ah, well, yes, well, well, we could, but we don't really, uh, uh, the thing is that they were, they were in the 112, that's the one that we have, we have our classic server, which we've been using since 2015, that's kind of a nice one, but then she mentioned Honeywell, which Dakota Redstone, one of our, uh, he used, to, he was our moderator for some time, but he's, he's, uh, 
I don't know what you'd say. He's kind of a guru for us and he has his own server. So when our server is, is housed at Ohio University and they have power cuts and it's in basically Aaron's office. So it's in a corner of his office and the cleaners come in and mop and dislodge the plug. Then they put us all offline for a while. So, uh, but, but Dax seems to be a little bit more reliable but it's a, a different environment because in our server, we have lots of, we've been using it for five years and we have lots of uh, capabilities that we give ourselves. For example, when you die, you don't lose all your stuff because we found that very frustrating. But Max is, uh, Dax is a very purist environment. And um, so that, um, Okay. Basically, it's, it's a little harder to play. Uh, okay. Perhaps I'll share the last slide. Right okay. Here. Mm -hmm. um, this is a summary by Don, Dr. Don Carroll from uh, Japan, and we were at the at Jolt Call two thousand nineteen, and this is his summary of our. Um, we shared uh, basically what we did in the Evo Minecraft community. And um, so he says that Minecraft, both as an online game and as diverse communities of practice offers tremendous opportunities for L2 language interaction through play and exposure to real world English. So Maddie was, in, in Minecraft, there's different biomes and, you know, in the desert, in the forest, and Maddie's, uh, these are all vocabulary that he could pick up in, a, in an authentic, um, you know, kind of way uh, as, a, as, uh, as um, compared with um, like textbook um, dialogues. Playing Minecraft is highly motivating and prompts learners to explore L2 resources on their own outside of the game. And so, um, there's a lot of Minecraft videos and wikis, websites, forums on Minecraft, and he's been uh, watching a lot of those, um, and uh, this helped him tremendously in, in learning English and in his vocabulary. And um, thanks to Vance, he, uh, you know, invited me to write this, an article on this, and um, I have, uh, this is, um, um, analyzed a uh, YouTube video, vocabularies on YouTube video, Minecraft YouTube videos. And um, if you're interested, this is, uh, you know, go. That uh, the link to our articles is in, do you want me to share a screen and show what okay. Okay. basically, okay, I'll just do that. Uh, so, was, okay, thank you. Um, so if I go back to this one, I suppose. Um, let's click the share button. Um, best of EVO, that would be this one right here. Okay, so this is the, uh, this is our, when it comes up, um, this is the document you've all been going to. And if you come down to ours, I'll just scroll down to the table of contents. It's a very slow scroll. Scroll. Okay, so uh, okay, EVO Minecraft MOOC. When you go there, uh, okay, there we are. Uh, it has our. I added our um, our publications. So James is right here. So and Don, by the way, is just trying to get into the room right now. So I'll let him in. But anyway, basically, that's that's the link. That's the research that Jane did on the game that she that Maddie created that she was showing us the wool game. No, there's no sorry, that was a different game. My mistake. Okay, so uh, uh, she did research on the vocabulary of Maddie and uh, another uh, son of somebody in our group named Emmanuel from Brazil, and they were in conversation and uh, and. Uh, Anyway, that's there are some articles that we've written there. Okay, I'm I'm gonna. Don is trying to get in. That's Evan. Yep. He's there. Did you got to hear? Yep. Okay. Any any, of course, following on what we've just been talking about. Any, any last words that you'd like to say about Minecraft EVO Minecraft MOOC? Uh, 
This is Abu Fletcher. Last words, first words. Well, yeah. you know. <laughs> well, I, I, I sort of came into it, uh, you know, as a very much of a skeptic. And um, I think I've changed my mind on a lot of aspects of it, of how it's useful and why it, for me, is a fascinating kind of new area of exploring interaction. And do you find, do you think it's useful with students or you just kind of feel compelled to stay up late at night and play? Well, I think um, I still see it as being more useful for child language development. Um, where we talk about child language that happens to be in an L2, um, I'm less convinced of its utility for, let's say, my university level language learners, just because they may not choose to interact with it in the same way that children do. Possibly, I was trying it with university level students and I wasn't really getting their buy-in, but they were a strange group of students anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, I don't want to, we've, we've gone, I think it's about 20 minutes now. I don't know, is there anything else we need to do here, Jane? Or well, have I have I missed the party? I thought we were starting we, at uh, starting at eleven twenty. We were supposed to, but then Heike didn't come, so or she isn't here at the moment. So we sort of took we just took it on. In fact, actually, right now I don't know if Kirsten <laughs> and uh, Marina and Virginia would like to, and Katrine would like to. Uh, is that Sue? Is that your group? That's. So, uh, Jane, have you already run through your presentation then? Yes, he I did. have. And well, I, 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 looked, I looked at all the slides. It's, it's fine, so. Okay. <laughs> Would you like to, yeah, um, the last slide? <laughs> Go ahead, so, Jane. Would you like to talk about the last slide? Uh, well, just the last slide was, uh, you know, my summary of what I thought about it based on the CA research that I started on it. And I think uh, that doing that project has motivated me to want to do a lot of other similar uh, sorts of analysis of, of uh, Minecraft-based interaction or really, you know, online interaction. Mm -hmm. Were you going to show the last slide? I just started a screen share here. Uh, oh, let's see, where okay. is it? I don't know if I don't, I don't think I have it up here. Maybe here. You might have to show it, Jane. Okay. Um, let's see. I don't know. This is not, this is English for the workplace. Okay. So I'll stop the share because I don't have that slide up. Okay. Let me share. Okay, this is mine. So yeah, um, Don, we were at the last point right here. Right. Yeah. Would Would you like? Now, to really, that second paragraph is more how I view um, Minecraft as a motivation for actual language learning. Um, I've actually always said that the amount of uh, talk that goes on within the gaming is relatively. Um, relatively limited. On the other hand, like, uh, you know, Maddie and others, they've, they've simply gone outside and they've, they've done an amazing job of learning on their own based on the YouTube tutorials, the websites, the forums, interacting outside. And I think that's a significant part of, of the game. You know, you can imagine the, the game itself is forming some core, but that core is actually a small part of a large uh, community um, involved in doing this. Mm -hmm. But I'm interested in the conversational analysis during gameplay. I mean, I'm interested in that in the, spec in the perspective. I believe there are going to be more and more online interaction. Minecraft happens to be something I'm looking at right now. It isn't so much I'm interested in Minecraft interaction as much as saying, uh, 
what, what is the nature of online interaction? I can start with saying, is it the same as face-to-face -face interaction? If not, what are the differences? So we already know that um, chat, so chat rooms are structured in a different way than sort of face-to-face -face conversations. Um, there's been a couple, there's one, one particular book by Chris Jinks that he outlines all the details of that. But uh, we don't really know so much about, is, is there some fundamental difference between face-to-face -face and face-to-face -face in a game? Um, based on what I saw in the Maddie Emanuel um, interaction, it looks largely the same to me. I mean, obviously there's different affordances, uh, things you can do, things you can't do within the gameplay. I know. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, what I'm trying to say is perhaps it's pretty much the same face-to-face, -face, but the point is in an EFL uh, setting, we don't have any like English native speakers or, you know, other speakers who can communicate, you know, with or practice English speaking with. Right. So this is only through this virtual space, virtual world in Minecraft that they're, they get to play and communicate in English because that's the only language that they have in common. So face to face, uh, would Maddie talk in English face to face with his peers? Definitely not. He's going right, to speak right. Chinese. So I think one of the affordance of uh, Minecraft is this virtual space where they can interact using the language, the common language. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and that's a big, big plus. And again, that's that's going to be um, more and more part of what is the nature of uh, language learning. And um, you know, actually the recent recent interview my university president asked me that did he think uh ai would make language teachers uh unnecessary and what i i quoted the old the old saying that uh computers will not replace teachers but teachers who use computers will replace teachers who don't and i think we can say let's you know move away from just that word computer and replace it with sort of, um, you know, interactive online experiences. You know, I, I just think there's this point that in the future, teachers will simply not be able to say, I don't want to do that. I don't like it. It has no value. Okay. I, I, I wonder if we could take, if there's anybody who wants to ask a question, you could ask it now. And then I think we need to move on because okay. uh, we were missing Heike, but Judy has just arrived. And of course, she's welcome to present. So um, we're, we, we, we might, well, I mean, you know, if we want to finish at uh, 1600, we would be in a little bit of a hurry. But uh, we don't really have to do that either. Um, so anybody have any comments or questions? Mike, are you? I I have a quick question. Yeah, the um, I I'm battling in and out of Minecraft, um, trying to find the time at the moment. I thought I'll have more time with the lock up with the the lock in, but it's, it's a lot less now than it was in the real classroom. Anyway, that's another story. Uh, my question is, um, what I haven't understood. I bought a small license for the Java uh, application, so I can actually enter the Minecraft world in single player and and slowly get into your multiplayer uh, through the server you mentioned, Jane. Uh, so does each of my students, if they want to do the same, connect with me, have to have their own uh, Java uh, uh, ID as well? Is that right? Am I saying it right? Yes, that that's question? right. They each have to have their own login. They have to pay $30 for it. Uh, the alternative is you can use Minecraft Edu, which does not connect to our Java server. But if yeah. you just want to keep it in your environment, if you want to play with your mm -hmm. students, you can uh, you can do that for I think it's uh, five dollars per student. You get twenty it's licenses. It's actually now now with the COVID, I think they've got some sort of a uh, special super duper deal. I think it might yeah. So but that's at Minecraft Edu. It does not. It's a 
uh, it's totally different. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, it's a Windows 10. Uh, it's an app based. Uh, uh, so it's um, it's economical, but it don't, it's limiting as far as you're just going to be interacting in your own space. Uh, you can connect computers within your environment. And it, uh, so if you want to play with us, you're going to have to, if you want them to play with us. Now, my students in uh, UAE were good hackers. They could hack into things. So. Yeah, I know what you mean. That I've been informed by my students already. Yeah. So, they, okay. yeah, the ones that want to know will, will know, yeah. Okay. Okay, well, I think we could, uh, we asked uh, the English for the Workplace people if they wanted to present to us at about this time. So maybe, is this a good time for you guys? English for the Workplace? Is that uh, Kirsten and Katrine and Marina and Virginia? Yes, um, okay. I'd like to share the screen, so I'll manage the slides. And can I just ask my four co-presenters, that's Sue, Marina, Katrin, and Virginia, to come on with a sound and camera. Yes, so yes, sure. I'm just start sharing this. Um, Absolutely. You should be able to do that. Hello. No okay, can you all see our slides? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. yep. Okay, good. So, um, okay, well, I think it's actually Sue Annan, who organized the whole thing, and maybe Sue, you're going to start talking a bit about what we actually did in English for the workplace. Yeah, first I'd like to mention the fact that this came out of a discussion with IATFO BSIG, and BSIG has always been very interested in what EVO are doing, and we've, we've been involved from time to time over the last uh, seven or eight years that I can think of. And what we wanted to do was give some of our own mix of specialists from many different countries and many different fields a chance to give back to the overall community, either for people who were business teachers already or teachers who are thinking about dabbling in business English in the future. So our plan was to look this time at how we could help them develop their competences in the classroom and whether they were working one-to-one -one in groups or even with university students. So that was the, the, the starting position. What we did was we asked for our experts, not only from IATFOB SIG, but also just business teachers and trainers around the world, to get involved with offers of help and uh, we came up with some quite interesting ways of helping the community at large. We started by looking at university teaching, we then moved on to tools and ideas of things we could do to help the pre-business learners. We looked then at business as a uh, as a different field and looked at ideas for, for helping people in the different fields to develop. We then looked at case studies, um, particular tools for developing. We got the people involved to feedback and share their ideas. And we decided this time, because of the end of Google Plus, to use Schoology which I think was actually a, an overwhelming success because we could see very easily what was happening in the interaction. Um, I'd like now to pass you on to the actual takeaways <laughs> and what happened when we actually started teaching. <laughs> okay, so I'll start with the, the first one. What we focused on was basically um, getting people into how to teach particular aspects of business English. So uh, Shweta Parakari did something about um, how to teach vocabulary to pre-service students, which I think is not only important for business, it's a lot when you teach vocabulary in a general way and also when you teach vocabulary at university. So here, um, so she uploaded um, a lot of videos. So we had a lot of um, speakers or 
moderators and presenters who really interacted via video, which I think is great for an asynchronous platform because you get an idea of the person who's teaching you. And then they also uploaded their PowerPoint slides and gave everybody a lot of work to do. So we were always very busy. And here are two examples. So um, Shweta talked about collocations and how to teach collocations and gave us examples to chew, like for example, can you find these collocations? And what I appreciated was that she put this back into the learner's position, which I think is always a very good idea if teachers become learners again and have to think about how would I do this, how would I do that, and what is actually in it for my students. Then we had also in another week um, two people, um, Ekaterina Krasikova, who focused on professional email writing, what's important, what kind of things do you need there? Because despite the fact that we move into Slack and messaging and all of this, emails are still very important in the workplace. And then we had um, Adi Rajan and he did a fantastic job on um, language in an IT environment. I think this is something we all really need to look at now because uh, we are all moving online and he was focusing on communication issues when you don't use functional language which clearly about giving instructions, um, what the, the virtual team has to do, how to re behave in a conference call. And he also chose a fantastic video about daily stand-up meetings. I finally understand now what daily stand-up meetings are. Um, and asked us really to explore the meeting with our students. And I think that was a fantastic thing. We get so many practical hands-on tips. Um, I have a student who works with Agile. She, she does this kind of IT project work. She has daily stand-ups. So we could explore the language of this video two days after um, I learned this from Adi. So I think it was also actually a pretty good um, success for all of us. And um, it was very interactive, despite the fact that we live in different time zones. There were lots of comments on Schoology. You're going to show some, or we're going to show some examples later. And that is basically, I think, the first takeaway, getting new ideas of how to teach language and how to teach vocabulary or specific business skills. So that's basically the first takeaway, which is where we move to the second takeaway, and that is um, Marina taking um, over. Yes, yes, hello. Uh, I hope you can hear me all right. So I'm going to talk about all the practical tips we uh, shared uh, in winter about how to create tasks for business English classes in various formats. And it was really amazing because, you know, the range of the tasks uh, suggested was really wide. Mm -hmm. uh, let me start by talking about uh, activities for ESP courses, for example, for finance and accounting professionals, which was delivered by Kirsten Wächter. And, you know, she proved that finance doesn't have to be boring. It can actually be fun, a lot of fun. Uh, you know, step by step, Kirsten showed us how to design engaging activities uh, for vocabulary presentation. I'll just give you a few examples, like word clouds where uh, different colors are used for different ideas, smart art, word families, word patterns, collocations, hierarchies. There were a lot of, you know, examples of crosswords, beautiful worksheets with, you know, step-by-step -step instructions. And that was really amazing. Um, besides, uh, Kisten showed us how to use Realia, you know, ranging from materials about financial scandals to some more serious video talks. Well, um, another thing I'd like to talk about is how to create podcasts with our students. Uh, not only to use those which already exist and are available online. And uh, Silke Riegler talked about that for us. Uh, first, she concentrated on the benefits of creating our own podcasts with our business English students. Because, um, well, basically that, uh, these kinds of assignments not only involve all kinds of uh, language skills, they improve students' vocabulary, grammar, it's a kind of authentic task. They create something new and that's very motivating and fun for them. Besides, she proved that it doesn't take a lot of preparation uh, and the technical aspect is not that challenging. Well, a smartphone with a voice recording app should be enough. Um, a very valuable thing that Silker uh, provided for us was this model, which you can now see. Um, it's a model of how to 
um, actually do podcasting with your students, starting with the preparation phase onto recording and then to the actual podcasting. And uh, actually the tasks uh, which were provided uh, gave us again this step-by-step -step guide of what we can do with our students in our classroom. Uh, this is something which I definitely am going to take away with me. Uh, if we could now move on to one more point. Um, this was uh, dedicated to how to create not ordinary role plays for our business English classes, but extended role plays where there is a story and it is broken down into a few episodes, just like, you know, a series, but a series which our students themselves act out in different um, classes, like not in just one class in 20 minutes, but in various classes. This was presented by me and um, I tried to uh, give a step-by-step -step guide on how to create role plays from your conception, from the conception of this <coughs> up to the actual realization <coughs> and the students acting them out. So we looked at uh, game elements and mechanics which exist and I showed how I personally select them for a particular game, uh, a role play which I call like the big London uh, meetup and uh, how they can be selected to fit the learning objectives of your particular course and your students needs. Um, then I also showed how well uh, it's possible to create a storyline, break it into a few episodes and uh, well think about the relationship be between uh, the characters, the participants. Actually I had 12 in this particular role play because I have 12 students in my group. Um, well and then how to actually organize this in one um, let's say diagram and then turn uh, this diagram into the actual descriptions, character cards, and role cards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, and the, the final point I made was, yes, uh, the final picture here. Um, what to, to, to bear in mind uh, when asking your students to act all these things out and how to implement this like in three or four classes or maybe more classes throughout the semester so that uh, you actually practice the language that you are teaching your students and uh, use uh, these role plays for assessment. Thank you. Okay, great. So, and I have to say that was also amazing stuff. Um, you could, we could actually watch the video that she recorded. And that takes us to our third takeaway, which is, um, I think, Virginia's role. Mm -hmm. Hold on a second. Yeah. Okay. Uh, right. Uh, well, we focused on uh, business. I mean, what's happening now with business communication that most of the interactions taking place in corporate life are among non-native speakers of English. So we thought it was time to revisit the role of error correction in spoken performance in business English classes. Um, uh, many teachers, whether in business English settings or general English contexts, uh, have seen their main classroom function as being an identifier and a corrector of errors. Uh, the whole process of teaching in the past was seen as being a gradual elimination of student error. And under this conception, uh, errors were defined as deviations from standard English norms. Uh, native speakers being, of course, the target uh, to achieve and imitate. So we discussed in, in a very um, interactive forum um, and a very uh, enthusiastic group of uh, practitioners, some of whom were already teachers of English, quite experienced uh, teachers of business English, and others were just uh, transitioning into the business world. So. Um, uh, we, we reflected on, on Belf, Elf, and the Belf and Elf mind sh uh, mindset change, um, the perspective, I mean, how this could change our views regarding correction of mistakes and giving feedback in oral performance in business English sessions. So in order to um, re reflect and, and re revise this, uh, this area in the light of Elf and Belf, we had to, uh, we, we discussed First, uh, what is language in the ELF or BELF perspective? Um, we revisited uh, uh, the notions of grammatical accuracy versus fluency. Uh, we also uh, went into uh, what is a mistake in this new perspective? Is it really a deviation from the norm 
um, is it, um, uh, I mean, do we, do we still have native English, native English norms as our target, as our final destination? We also uh, explored in passing uh, this question of interlanguage um, and uh, whether, I mean, whether the destination is always native speaker norm and then interlanguage is this path. Uh, I mean, this, this path that the learners have to go through to get again to the final destination. Um, some people mentioned that no matter how much we want to alter this, this path of acquisition, uh, learners have their own internal agendas that cannot be changed. Then we also discussed um, some techniques having to do with, um, um, well, sorry, before I go into that, um, thinking about standard English as a norm, yes or no, we discussed uh, what to correct, whether we would be focusing on pragmatics versus grammar mistakes, uh, which of the two would take priority in a business English context, and um, always having or taking into account intelligibility as the destination or as the target, not uh, rather than standard English as a norm, right? Uh, we discussed briefly then the role of the teacher. Is the teacher the one that should correct? Uh, I mean, as um, going back to what I said before, is the role of the teacher the corrector, the, the one that has to eradicate mistakes? What about peer correction? What about the learner doing self-correction. Um, and then we, we also went in passing uh, into the um, idea of when to correct in class, whether to implement spot correction or hot correction, um, and, uh, or whether to um, implement delayed or cold correction. And we finally came to the conclusion that choosing one strategy or the other basically has to do with whether it's fluency time, and then if it's fluency time, we would choose delayed or cold correction. Uh, if it's accuracy time, uh, we would, in most cases, apply uh, the idea of uh, spot or hot correction. So we, um, the, thought, the, the, the takeaways for attendees were basically this uh, idea of reflecting and challenging teacher views in the light of Belf and Elf. That's basically uh, what uh, we discussed during my session. Okay, and we also had something about, of course, a needs analysis, a colleague of ours, Andrei Stesik, he did something, he really created a whole case, he gave us the needs analysis, um, explained what it's good for, and then our participants had to design the entire course program, which was also very um, collaborative and competitive at the same time. And Virginia already mentioned bells, and this is something that our fourth um, speaker is going to talk about, that's Katrin Lichterfeld, who's talking about um, how we use different concepts in the business English classroom. Katrin? Yes, hello, welcome. So, first of all, I would like to start with uh, something that our colleague Marcella Harrisberger presented, an agile classroom using project management tools and um, this approach may have come in very handy having the COVID-19 and the move to teaching online in mind because she, uh, she suggested something consisting of three different pillars. That means on the one hand Trello um, as the heart of it and um, being a visualizing project management tool where you get an overview of your whole English course. You could use it for face-to-face -face, um, courses but as well for teaching online. And as everything is at one glance, um, the flipped classroom as second pillar could come in very handy. And stu students are asked to carry out any activities apart from speaking on their own. So that means increasing a learner autonomy and motivation at the same time. As underlying principle, she made use of the Scrum framework as well. And here it is important to consider that it is not necessary to be fully aware of all the details, but to have it as an underlying principle, especially paying attention to the agile thing. That means um, showing students how important it is to plan strategies, to do, to carry them out, to monitor them and to adjust them whenever um, necessary. So we are talking about a kind of learning cycle that is implemented within 
uh, this whole approach. First of all, some participants were a little bit skeptical whether only experienced learners or those being familiar with the IT business, where the Scrum especially is um, used quite a lot, um, or whether they have to be expert in project management. But later it turned out that the participant could kind of transfer this uh, approach to any teaching context and they highly liked the idea of getting this feeling of um, achievement which is um, highlighted by the drag and drop uh, facility that is added by Trello. So Trello is very similar to a Moodle platform um, and it could work as your LMS it is, it is free of charge and easy to use, could be used for collaborative projects and um, I think that especially um, the agile approach is something that we should have in mind because it also increases the importance of employability skills. That means being able to adjust to a world of VUCA. And that brings us um, to the to other aspects. Um, the world of VUCA is characterized by uh, four principles. That means volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity and um, how to deal with this. Um, on the other hand, we are in a situation where English has a status and is um, as widely used as no other language before. And it is very likely for our learners that there is a percentage figure of 80% um, that there will not be any native speaker included. That kind of refers to what, uh, what um, Virginia already mentioned. Um, as as a consequence, the Council of Europe, which published the first common European framework of reference in 2001, decided to update it, its version and to publish um, the companion volume in order to, to offer some answers how to deal with all of these things. Um, according to the OECD, we need 21st century skills, the four C's, collabor collaboration, creativity, communication, um, and critical thinking have to be included in order to deal with the complexity of our uh, WUCA world. And that means um, that um, the current edition of the CFR kind of gives us a framework that moves from um, the learner as a speaker making use of language only and if we ask our our learners when carrying out a needs analysis um, they often only mention language aspects and they are not really aware that areas like communication styles or maybe intercultural um, differences may be the reason for the difficulties that they have when communicating internationally and for that reason we have to consider that our learners have to behave as social agents they have to become aware how english is used internationally they have to become aware of um, the fact that they have a lot of linguistic and cultural um, repertoires at their hands they should make use of non-verbal things as well which are especially important when looking at teaching online or meeting online and um, having this in mind, um, we really have to um, consider um, that, um, that the, um, the, the recent discoveries of research, and now ELF comes into, into, um, into the discussion too, are uh, important too, because um, the native speaker model disappeared from the new companion volume. The focus is now on intelligibility. And as Jennifer Jenkins, um, the so-called pioneer of the English as a lingua franca research already demonstrated, pronunciation is the key factor of communication breakdown. And that means um, that English as a lingua franca has to be considered as the central part. But that does not mean that standard English has to disappear altogether because the context our learners have to work in have to be considered too. And depending on the situation, depending on the cultural influences, they will start a kind of conversational contract with their communication partners. And if we move to the next slide, we'll have a closer look at the concept of uh, business English as a lingua franca. 
it is very important to have a flexible BELF mindset. You cannot teach BELF. And this is something that the participants of, um, of the EVO really became aware of. Um, there are deeply rooted beliefs and we have attitude, we have assumptions concerning um, the importance of the native speaker role. And we have to be able to make use of means of accommodation and intelligibility to really adapt to the different situations um, we, are, we found ourselves in. The research of BELF came up with a very important um, issue, um, communities of practice. They are considered to be ideal places of informal learning. The, the employees suddenly turn into competent and confident users of the language. And it's not only English that they use. So we have many things um, that are important. And um, it was quite interesting to see how the participant, uh, participants kind of learned the complexity and try to put it into practice. So that's where we need to wrap up because Vance is already messaging me on this because we have a few more presenters and we started actually five minutes earlier. So thank you very much to Katrin for this kind of dense version. I put some ideas on uh, if you want to try Trello in the chat box as well. So um, just to wrap up the takeaway for our participants, that's what we discussed. Um, Yes, two days ago when we thought about, okay, how can we do this? How do we, what do we want to share? I think what was great for them, you see here some of the materials they uploaded and some of the discussions. So we had lots of comments feeding on each other was the very meaningful interaction for the participants as well. They really made the topics their own and they worked uh, um, on how they were used in, in their context. And we have now such a fantastic list of resources, all kinds of articles, videos, and so on. And I think what they really got was the confidence to explore on their own after the course. And um, they used the whole thing as a think tank for brainstorming, further brainstorming. For us as the presenters and moderators, it was just also a very rich resource that we shared because um, it's really interesting to see the insights you get on your own input from other often experienced teachers. We had a very supportive group of both presenters and participants who are very active. And I think we all like this collective beehive intelligence that sort of builds on ideas and um, gets us to develop further. And again, we also like the collection of resources and that the moderators were also taking part in the other course modules. So we were also participants and learners. And I think that's it from the English for the Workplace group. Thank you very much. When the, uh, when the screen share went off, it switched my screens around. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I really hate to rush people off because your presentation is very interesting. Uh, to perpetuate it a little bit further, does anybody have any questions that they'd like to ask uh, the workplace people, the workplace presenters? I'm interested in Trello. I, I, uh, you said it could be a portal for your group. Uh, I found it a little domineering, but maybe that was the way that someone was using it. Um, we used it a lot in um, projects, for example, when you work with, with lots of different texts so for publishing projects. And the nice thing is the visuality so that you can really say, okay, so we have the resources, we have the assignments. And when the student hands in an assignment, the assignment is taken through the different stages, the peer-to-peer -peer feedback, the teacher feedback, and then the completed. So students also get a uh, sense of that they are achieving something. And, um, and it makes sense to do this. You can embed all kinds of links. You can embed things to your SharePoint. You can upload files. And I find it a lot easier to manage than some of these really complex tools that you have for project management. And I put another link in. I don't want to take time from the other presenters, but I put another link in if you want to find more, uh, find, want to find out more about Agile, Scrum, and Sprint, and that kind of thing. Um, and I see, Sue, so is Marcella's video on YouTube? Maybe we can post the link to Marcella's video because she did such a fantastic job of explaining it. So, okay, yeah. great. I, I don't know if you've seen it. I'll just put a, a link in the text chat here, but there's, uh, mm -hmm. I'm blogging all of these. 
I've got the first two videos done already. Uh, let me see if I can find the, doing a little bit of multitasking here and things aren't responding perfectly. Vance, right. can you check? Can mm. you check the waiting room, please, Vance? Yes, of course. Okay, so uh, I'm checking the, wait the waiting room quite frequently. But anyway, that, that link that I just put in there, which, oh, it, uh, sorry, that didn't go to everybody because Mike had just asked me to check the. Kirsten, okay. can you post the link again? Perhaps you. I haven't posted anything yet. I'm going to. I'm going yeah. to. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and what I was coming to, and let me check the waiting room, make sure that everybody is. Uh, being let in. I'm not sure that's it. Anyway, uh, but at that link that I just put there, which is the blog for this, all the text chats are going there. All the everything is going there with all the links. So if you put links in the text chat, they will be posted to the blog that's archiving this material. So please do put anything. Yes, I see people are waiting there. I've let Martha in already. Uh, maybe she's having and Juliana as well. Maybe she's having, uh, maybe they're having some bandwidth issues there that are dropping out again. Okay, so anyway, no problem. Uh, no, no problem telling me to go and check it, it's just fine. Uh, the waiting room is just so in case there's any problem, I can move people to the waiting room and kind of, uh, it's kind of like a virus chest, you know, you, you can keep people there if there's any problem. Okay, so anyway, uh, thank you very much. I think the next people up, if I'm not mistaken, who would it be? Who, does it, who do you think it is? It could be, it's the flipped learning people. So it's Marta, who is now here, and Jeff, if he's here, and Diana, and uh, Gabriella, and Mike. So welcome, people. So, and they're talking about flipped learning. I, it's hard to read because they turned it upside down. <laughs> okay, let me just find the uh, the presentation. No worries. Yeah, you you can do a screen share. Hey, Jeff, how you doing? Last time I hey, saw Vince. you, you were, you were in Bangkok. I was a little small postage stamp yeah. of a screen. Yeah, cool. Glad to have you here in this session. I I do know Jeff though, uh, face to face. I know he's not just a virtual entity and. He actually does exist somewhere. He's over there in Oregon somewhere. Where it's right. eight o'clock in the morning. Not oh, my cool. best time. Ah, okay. It's like 11 o'clock here. It's also not my best time, but anyway, there we are. We compromise. Okay, so we're going to hear about flipped learning. Uh, and then after that, there's going to be Nagla telling us about grammar and TESOL. And then we're going to hear from Judy, who's uh, going to be talking about uh, teaching English to uh, EFL to young learners. Okay. So, so we have a wonderful tradition in flipped learning. Every year we, have to, we try to have at least one newcomer on our moderating team. Mm -hmm. And the only job of that newcomer is that they do this session. So, ladies and gentlemen, I give you Mike in Greece. Hey, hey Mike. <laughs> All right. Hey. Hello, everyone. Hi. Hi, Mike. Hi. 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 Well, um, but the rest of well, us are going to sing along. Oh, great. <laughs> I'm just doing the introductions. <laughs> no, no. Uh, on a serious note, yeah, I was just a, um, a participant last year, um, and I really... Uh, got a lot out of it, apart from the, uh, uh, the pedagogy and the methodology or the model, I should say, or, uh, or method maybe, uh, of flip learning and how it's used. I really got the, the feel of uh, a community of educators of, uh, 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 that are open and willing to share what they have and their knowledge. And, and I really also had a good time. So this year, uh, I, I was asked to, to tag along as well, and I did. So, um, this is a flip learning team this year. Um, it consisted of Jeff, uh, Magotok, uh, Carolina, uh, Martha, Juliana, Diana, Gabriella, and me, Mike. Um, hey, Mike, you want to share your screen? Oh, I didn't share it, really. So... Here it goes. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. 
So, yeah, as I was saying. Um, so, uh, as you can understand, the, um, the target group is for um, newcomers to uh, the, the flip learning and also to experienced flippers as well. Um, and uh, it's a very warm and welcoming um, team uh, sessions, uh, even through the uh, um, throughout the weeks uh, of attending, or even before with the, the designing of the you know, uh, the the actual uh, session, it was quite interesting for me. It was my first time, um, and basically um, uh, we moved along from there. Do I suggest? Uh, well, we used uh, a couple of platforms. Um, one of the main platforms was the LMS, the, the Canvas. And through that, um, uh, we also used Anvil. And that's from the uh, uh, University of Oregon, the Yamada Learning Center. And it's really quite cool because it, uh, it's a module that fits into Canvas. And behind that, it's an easy tool where you can actually uh, design and structure the pages that the, uh, the, the participants actually viewed. And it also has um, a H5P, which is an open platform using um, uh, various uh, tools. You can you import your video a bit like Edpuzzle and you can stop it and, and make your own quizzes and stuff like that. So it was, it was really good tools uh, that I came across. And now I'm actually started using some of these tools in my own lessons. Um, communication was mostly done through um, the, the Canvas LMS, through the commenting section, direct messaging, uh, and a bit through uh, our Facebook group, Flip Learning and Language Teaching. Great. Like all and groups, I think we had to uh, deal with that loss of Google Plus as our primary uh, communication platform. And I think we, while well, we missed a lot of the affordances of uh, uh, Google Plus Canvas proved to be okay. Yep. yep. So, um, moving along, who's next? Okay, I'll start with uh, week one. So, oh, um, so since we've been uh, giving this session for a couple of years, for maybe four or five years, Jeff? Um, five years. Five years, every year we tweak it, we add new things, we make changes. Um, so this year, what we did was we started with, uh, of course, flip, what flip learning is and, and getting uh, participants familiarized with the, the pillars. And something that we've added, I think since maybe two years ago is uh, mindset. So we started with uh, the concept of innovators mindset from uh, George Caro's book, The Innovators Mindset. And uh, then we've moved into growth mindset and uh, teaching uh, or uh, offering different resources to understand the difference between a growth and a fixed mindset and how uh, educators need a growth mindset in order to get into flipping because it requires a change. Like you literally need to change your mindset to start flipping. So um, this, this year we started with mindset and of course all the intros um then we went and then what we do is that we divide the pillars of flip learning into the weeks so you will see the f is flexible environment l learning culture i intentional content p professional educator so every week uh, we go a little more in depth in each of these pillars with specific types of tasks such as understanding how we can lesson plan uh, within a flipped learning approach um, and I mean understanding the styles and and we, we all of the moderators share our styles of, of planning then you know get into the whole planning situation right lesson plan design then curator create your, your own material if you want to and uh, and then there's a reflection on uh, educators as professionals in and within this process, there's peer assessment among the participants. So they check their own lesson plans. Um, they give each other comments. And of course, we're always there to provide feedback on how they're doing with this uh, planning process. I don't know if I've missed, I probably missed a lot of things, but if any other moderator wants to step in <laughs> and add 
Oh, and we also have, uh, we, we have synchronous sessions on, we had synchronous sessions on Sundays and we had a couple of guest speakers, which we will mention a little later. Yeah, there's something I would like to add. Hello, everyone. And it is yeah. that we use the pillars of, from the Flip Learning Network, and we happen to have Helene Marshall here. Uh, she is not a current moderator, but she's the mom of these sessions. So shout out to Helene, who is here in the audience. And so we are now, as you saw, um, it's been taken over by Colombians, this thing, <laughs> for <laughs> Colombians. Uh, uh, initially, it was um, Helene, um, Jeff, uh, father and mother are here, uh, but it was also John and uh, Kevin and Khaled, and they have all uh, stepped out and we have stepped in and we're all receiving every year new moderators. So um, we need to add some variety to those flags. So <laughs> uh, we welcome new participants every year. And the pillars, uh, we have decided to stick to the pillars because even though every year uh, new things emerge and flip learning, I think it's a, it's a very rapid uh, progression and growth um, in a topic. Uh, every year new things come up, uh, standards and uh, indicators and many more things. We have stuck to the pillars because we think um, they are easy, they are nice, and they are some, um, they're a very good way to provide structure to our session for newcomers. So we don't want to overwhelm people. Uh, most of them are coming now to our session with some basic knowledge of what flip learning is, but what they want to do is to learn how to do it. And so I guess the people who took our session this year are very happy now that they have had to go uh, to full online teaching because they may have uh, collected some tools and done uh, some, some ideas, you know, gathered some ideas for what's happening right now. So the next slide uh, precisely is the tools that we use. So Mike, could you? Yeah. Thank you. So as Mike said, we used Anvil, we used Canvas, which I didn't know before and I absolutely loved. Uh, it was great. It was a very robust uh, tool. Uh, we used Flipgrid in some of the tasks. Uh, mm -hmm. Twitter is always uh, something we use to communicate with participants during the week and Zoom for synchronous sessions. So I think these were kind of like uh, basic tools for most sessions, say for example, Flip, Flipgrid, Zoom and Twitter, but we definitely invite you to take a look at Canvas. Um, well, and Anvil is from the University of Oregon. So I guess you have to talk to Jeff there. Okay, so I'm off, who's next? <laughs> okay. Jeff? I'll talk about participants, yeah. So I think probably like a lot of EVO sessions or just about every free online learning class I've ever participated in, the enthusiasm at the outset is tremendous. The numbers of people who actually show up at, by the end of week one is significantly less. And those who endure and sort of follow the, the session throughout um, is an even smaller group. So I think we started out with around 260. Uh, we had about 160 who were active um, with an average of about 80 a week uh, of unique logins. And I think 27 actually earned our certificate of participation, which meant that they uh, both submitted a, submitted a lesson plan and participated in uh, peer and, and self-reflection on that lesson plan. Um, thanks to Mike, uh, our participation from Greece was enormous. And they were not only some of our best participants, but they brought a real, uh, sunny spirit to uh, um, times that became darker as we went on. Um, a lot of initial interest from Russia and Ukraine, but um, not a lot of follow through. And um, a fair amount of participation from, um, the, um, from Serbia, Croatia, and uh, Slovenia. Those were, I think were our largest uh, groups of participants. And, and Argentina and, and Chile and Colombia too. Um, I think we'll talk next about who showed up on our Sunday morning sessions, and I'll pass that to, um, back to Martha, I think. She's going to talk about her guests. Just add a comment here, the, uh, which we talked about with Jeff and the crew earlier, is the, uh, that there was a, those 
quite a slight increase this year in the participants that finished and attended the sessions. Yeah. Okay. Guest speakers, Diana, um, is that right? Yeah, so I'll start. Um, we had different guest speakers each week. So in uh, like at the end of week one, we had Adrian Lace. And Adrian Lace, I'm going to send a link of his, well, everything he's done. Um, he's a researcher. He works at Miyagi University in Japan. And we invited him to join us for this session because he has become an expert in, or he's been an expert in flipped learning. He's done a lot of research with flipped learning. But also he's, um, he's transitioned from flipped learning into uh, researching about mindset, which is uh, what I've done myself as well. So um, he was very kind to join us at, I think it was midnight his time uh, in Japan. And he connected with us uh, for almost an hour talking about his research, mindset, flip learning, etc. cetera. So uh, and good wine. very happy. Uh, yeah, well, he drank some wine, and it was it was a wonderful session, and we were very honored to have him join us. Um, you know, just to talk about flip learning and the connection with mindset. Yeah, during the week two, we had Ken Bauer, the current chair of the Flip Learning Network. Uh, he was in Colombia for Flip Tech Latin America last year, and so uh, we had. Mm, we had been in touch since 2015 online, and I got the, we got to meet him face to face last year here in Colombia, so that was wonderful. And he joined us uh, for the session to share uh, his view on the flip learning network view on the future of flip learning and how things are going. So it was fantastic as well to have him around. And in week three, we had our inimitable Van Stevens, who was giving a keynote in Bangkok, Thailand about flipped, the flipped classroom and teacher training. So we uh, sort of made that our live presentation of the week. And I'll let Vance say one word about that. Uh, um, and then in week four, um, sorry. That was my word. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like my plenary. One word from Vance, one word from Vance. Uh, <laughs> flip it. <laughs> Okay, how about this word, five minutes? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so in the next slide, you will find our next speaker for week four. And um, well, we have, uh, he's a science teacher, David, and he helped us with some information of his work as a flipper. And he has been flipping for over 10 years now. And he, well, he enlightened us with some strategies on how to create and record uh, your own videos when you want to show content to the students. So he shared with us these uh, innovative ways and unique ways to create videos and how to incorporate those in, in his classes, in our classes too. Okay, uh, and for week five, uh, which was all about professional uh, teachers as professional educators, we have George Kuris, who was giving us some very useful insights, in-depth insights, about what is it to be a professional educator? What is, a, what is our role in this never-ending cycle of learning, not, not only from students, but from teachers as well? So you can move on. Oops, sorry. Guys, takeaways? You start, Mike. Yep. Oh, great. Where do I start? Leon, takeaways. Um, <laughs> uh, it was really good to interact with uh, other uh, educators around the world. Um, you know, it was only my second year and in Flipped for, I think it's my fourth year with Evo. I only just started recently. Um, it's always a, a pleasure in, in connecting with other educators and uh, the experience you get in uh, sharing knowledge and, in, uh, you know, and the interaction that happens, um, it's just overwhelming. 
and it, and it continues the connection continues and and the idea of this electronic village is alive and it, and it's moving and and it's you know it's very difficult to explain to other uh, professionals that don't actually experience the same um, that's why everywhere I go I, I try to talk as much as I can about the Evo sessions um, um, I think one of the big the big things like you know, uh, one and a half to two years ago I didn't know about um, uh, that much about mindset and um, even though I, I was part of the the, the, the uh, um, the, the, the open mindset and and being a thinker, I think uh, one of the good thing is, is actually connecting with the idea of making mistakes and learning from your mistakes and passing that on to your students and, and preparing um, uh, meaningful and purposeful uh, tasks. So as we can see from the comments from both Fatima and uh, Julieta, um, that the, the way you approach um, your task, having a growth mindset in mind, um, and the whole notion of of empowering your students in 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 the, the group workspace and taking out um, whatever you can from the uh, the uh, the group workspace and putting it into the individual workspace. I think that's what gave uh, an experience to all participants and to co-moderators as well. Um, Okay, um, and I won't mention the tools that we get exposed to uh, as moderators, like this year with a lot of like Canvas and 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 heaps of other tools and and uh, uh, Padlet and and it just goes on and on, you know, rubrics and 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 what have you. Um, you're always with you're always left with a lot of. Um, ideas to work on and it just keeps on going so would anyone else like to add to that martha i think Yay. one of the biggest um <laughs> i think one of the, the biggest takeaways that i that i have every year is the fact that when we start a new year of evo um there are educators who come back and they come back every year we've had educators who have taken evo who maybe four years ago joined us and then the following year they came back and then they come back and they come back. And as, as a moderator, what that tells us is that what we are uh, working on and, and the changes that we make to this session is relevant um, and meaningful for educators enough for them to come back and dedicate five weeks um, a year, you know, to, 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 to learn together with us. So, um, I guess taking into account the current situation we're living in and maybe not so much connected to evil, but to the topic of flipped learning. I know that uh, many of us have been contacted to help out, uh, you know, in this whole, we've been asked to, uh, you know, put our school online, you know, about flipped learning. Can you help us? Um, I know Diana, uh, you know, she was kind of named the, I don't know, the pedagogical something. <laughs> that, that, I don't remember the exact term, but, at her school, they told her like, you need to help us out. Yes. Um, and, and I know, I know Carolina, I know like more from the Colombians in Colombia, the four of us have been contacted to help in this transition into at putting videos, flipping, et cetera. So I think that's a great takeaway. Um, you know, with taking into account this, this current situation, like flipping yeah. definitely yeah. is relevant to what we're living right now. Okay, let me interject just to, if anybody has a question, maybe Mike, we would like to ask if anybody has a question or did you want to uh, make a point? That's quite all right as well. Just trying to move things. We, we have three more speakers, which is fine. We just will go over time. We don't have to close everything up. Everything is fine. Go ahead. Didn't mean to interrupt. I'm just well, just to put a the final point on on uh, Martha's, uh, of all of the participants, perhaps the most uh, satisfying was John Graney, who was one of the founders of this EVO. And he's retired and finds himself back teaching part-time in a community college because they have such a need for students. And he said, I need to take this EVO for myself this time. And uh, so nice, 
modeling and reflection of how we're, we're all always teachers and learners. Yeah, and we like to take questions from the audience. Uh, Don had one in the chat, but uh, yeah, that's what I was about to say. Don has mm -hmm. uh, one in the chat. Mm -hmm. It's been answered from Elaine. <laughs> uh, can we really define flip learning as a combination of synchronous and non-synchronous online learning? Um, I, I was answering in the chat that precisely flipping doesn't necessarily require technology or uh, online learning and uh, well, Carolina and I have worked a lot in class flip. So if you're flipping in class and you don't have technology, it, it can be done. So, so not necessarily is the response. <laughs> yes, but not necessarily. Yeah. And you can do it all fully online, like uh, with the software, what Lane is putting there, the synchronous online flip learning approach. So you can do it at as many levels as you need. As many levels as, sorry, you heard that, okay. <laughs> as many levels as you need and want, like fully online, not online, um, blended, mixed. I mean, it's, it's just very versatile, I think. Okay, well, thank you very much. Appreciate your spending, I really hate to cut this off, this could go for another half hour easily. Uh, just what the points you just brought up, how you can do this in many different environments is a, another half hour yeah. right there. <laughs> Maybe you could post something we could read in the chat. But, okay. Uh, yeah, I'd like to move on to, we've got Nagla, uh, grammar for TESOL. She's the next one up. And then Heike missed her slot, but she's circling and she's ready for landing now. So we, I think we can work her in. And uh, then Judy and Nevis are going to, to talk about uh, teaching EFL to young learners. So we might take us a little bit over the top of the hour but that's okay, we'll, we'll tolerate it. So, um, uh, Nagla, are you ready? Yes, you are, I can see, okay, hi Nagla. Okay, uh, let me, um, do you have my PowerPoint or shall I share you can, it? From you my... can share it, yeah, please share it. Uh -huh. Okay, just a second. Do you know how to do that? Uh, I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just a second, sorry. Mm -hmm. No I should problem. Have been prepared. I thought uh, you would you would share it. Just a second. Okay. Uh... It's okay. We all need a break. <laughs> all right. Can you see it now or? No, you have to hit no. the share okay. button and then you have to select okay. a something. And you also have a blue share button once you've selected the window. Yes, there we go. Okay, you've got perfect. it. Perfect. All right. <laughs> okay, so uh, hello, everyone. Um, I first would like to thank you, Vans and, and Jane, for organizing this event and thanks to all the EVO team. So um, this is my, this was my first time um, uh, creating and, and uh, moderating a session uh, on EVO. So um, I'll be talking a little bit about this. Um, so my session, as you can see, is Grammar for TESOL. Maybe I should have the slideshow here. Um, okay. Yeah, I just hit the present. There you go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, um, so first of all, a little bit about myself. Um, um, my name is Nagla Salem, and um, I'm originally from Egypt. Um, I've been living in Toronto, Canada for over 24 years. Um, my experience is mostly in uh, teaching English for academic preparation and uh, introduction to linguistics and uh, intercultural communication courses at the university and college level. Uh, my co-moderator was Nelly Deutsch, um, and uh, I'll be talking about Nelly uh, on several occasions during the presentation. Okay, so a little, um, this outline, um, a little bit about the, the session, looking at the session at a glance, and then going through um, the weekly content and activities that stood out for me as well as the participants. And uh, I will also be sharing uh, some ideas that I felt worked for me as a first-timer 
um, and some helpful suggestions for those who are interested in, uh, in moderating EVO for the first time or co-moderating uh, for the first time. Okay, so this is a screenshot of uh, my session, Grammar for TESOL. And uh, the hosting platform was Nelly, and uh, I would like to thank Nelly very much. Um, she offered me the space on Moodle uh, when uh, I was participating in the, um, the moderator training session back in October and November. And um, it was interesting because a year earlier, I, uh, I was a participant on the Moodle for Teachers. And uh, it's, uh, it was interesting to see how it all came back to me as I was working on uh, my, my own session this time. It was a little bit, I was a little bit nervous at first, but uh, I always remembered uh, what Nelly uh, told us when we were participating in her uh, Moodle for Teachers. Don't worry, you will not break anything. So, um, yeah, so I was really encouraged um, to, to use Moodle, even though it was my very first time. Um, my rationale was uh, for grammar for TESOL was that um, I felt a lot of the times we make uh, grammar uh, teaching choices or um, like uh, practical considerations as we teach and so on, and we don't really know why we do it, or maybe we cannot really articulate um, uh, a reason or, or justify why we make these uh, grammar teaching choices and so on. And a lot of discussions happen in the in a staff room, and I and I felt that why not uh, talk about this in in a grammar session. My aim was uh, specifically for uh, new teachers, but then I thought maybe I can extend it to um, like more experienced teachers to maybe share their ideas to maybe relearn or unlearn <laughs> the way they uh, they teach grammar. Um, so the session uh, objectives uh, were mostly to uh, look a little bit at some theory and, and knowledge aspects when it comes to teaching grammar in the English uh, second or foreign uh, classroom, uh, English as a second language or foreign language. And, and then to look at um, some practical aspects. So we looked at um, uh, lesson planning and some activities um, and also uh, error correction and, and what, uh, what practical considerations are considered with error correction and um, again, how can we justify that? Um, the first week, um, of course, like most of the EVO sessions, we have the introductions and so on. Uh, what the, the activities that stood out were uh, the online survey. So the online survey um, was intended to get people to think about what they believe, uh, what, what their grammar beliefs are, what is a grammar and, and learning grammar for them and so on, whether they're native or non-native speakers. And uh, it was interesting because we had participants from everywhere from the US, from Japan, from uh, Russia, Ukraine, Serbia, Egypt, um, so many um, uh, backgrounds and also as far as their areas of expertise and, and, uh, and teaching experiences, there were uh, new teachers and there were uh, more experienced teachers, there were teachers who were mostly uh, teaching um, English as a second or foreign language or uh, teaching content-based uh, 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 courses to, uh, to uh, uh, English as an additional uh, language learners. Um, uh, another thing that I, I, I felt was, again, uh, very engaging to the session participants was to share the results of the survey and then get them to, to comment on, uh, on, on those results as well. And they could see a lot of similarities in how people think about grammar and the importance of grammar and whether to teach it explicitly or implicitly and why and so on. Um, another interesting activity um, that I felt, again, was quite successful was the uh, grammar metaphors um, on Padlet. And um, I, I have the link in the shared uh, document um, that uh, Jane and, and uh, Vance has uh, organized. Um, so they were asked to create a, a metaphor uh, that they have for grammar and, and then explain that metaphor. Why do they think uh, of that metaphor as best representing their idea of learning or, or teaching grammar and so on? Um, what I did uh, was I, I in my uh, weekly summary PowerPoint, um, I gave a sort of a visual representation of uh, the participants' metaphors. 
uh, for grammar. So it was very interesting. I was really amazed with the level of creativity that people had about uh, uh, grammar metaphors and, um, and was delightful to see um, their explanations. So it, it was great. And also a few of them had not used Padlet. Um, so it was good to be uh, trying their hands at uh, new tools while uh, interacting with the content and reflecting and so on. Uh, week two, we mostly looked at uh, the knowledge aspect. So I shared from some resources, articles and videos, um, and I used online tools uh, so like Quizlet and so on for grammar terminology. Um, and teachers were, um, some of them were introduced to, but others were aware, but maybe needed to also reflect on uh, pedagogical knowledge and uh, pedagogical content knowledge. Um, and also, which is now, quite relevant these days is technological, pedagogical content knowledge to add a little bit of online tools uh, to that. So they were um, asked to use some new presentation tools that they have not used before, like uh, emails and Bizme and, and so on. And uh, they, they were invited to choose a grammar point and then decide on how they would present that or how they would, what kind of knowledge they would need to learn about that uh, grammar point. So let's say the present perfect, what content knowledge you need to know about present perfect. And then uh, how are you going to deliver that? What, what pedagogical knowledge do you need? And then combining those and also thinking about what online tools will be helping you either uh, to deliver uh, that point and, and make it uh, clear to your students or get them to, to practice using it as well. Um, moving on, the third uh, week was looking at some practical considerations. So first we brainstormed using Padlet, we brainstormed uh, ideas or characteristics for uh, successful um, materials for teaching grammar or practicing grammar. And then the participants signed up for uh, teams uh, where they, they chose um, a certain grammar point and then worked together on uh, creating a lesson plan or creating um, an activity. Um, the, the teams and the grammar points were self-selected. And uh, uh, again, uh, they had to after they present uh, their, uh, their lesson plans and so on, they need to give an, an explanation uh, of their choices and so on, taking into consideration all the knowledge and, and the um, sort of the theory that we had discussed in weeks, um, in the earlier, earlier weeks, one um, and two. Um, the, the week four was another, again, looking at a practical consideration, and that was error correction. So um, we had a lot of uh, resources to look at, not, not too many, but uh, some of them, of course, were optional, but to look at uh, certain um, articles on to correct or not to correct, and, and uh, why do we correct and how do we correct when it comes to uh, grammar errors. Um, the survey, again, um, and sharing the results of the survey uh, proved to be very engaging. Um, and specifically, like when the results were very similar, people wanted to know what other teachers were thinking about grammar, um, error correction, and so on. But for example, a question like this one where um, they were asked about comprehensive feedback or selective feedback, which one do you choose? And you can see from the results of the survey that it was, it was quite divided. And, and we had a lot of discussion about that. Um, oh, uh, before I move on to the final week, so what they uh, were um, invited to do is uh, I provided a, a sample student writing and then I, I invited them to, uh, like it had errors and I invited them to uh, show us how they would uh, address that student, whether they would correct their errors, what kind of feedback they would provide. Um, and so on. So um, some participants decided to choose their own students' work or maybe use the one that was posted there. And of course, using the um, um, online uh, like uh, shared uh, collaborative tools and so on, uh, they, they talked to us and, and they uh, justified uh, the choices that they make. And, and it was interesting where everyone was really um, attending to, their, to their, the context of, of their teaching. Finally, uh, the week five, uh, we talked about what are um, 
opportunities for professional development when it comes to uh, working on grammar um, and learning more grammar tools or, or uh, uh, certain um, ideas to, uh, to tackle when it comes to teaching uh, grammar. And uh, we also talked about observation and how we can use observation um, as, as a way for professional development. And then um, the participants were asked to create word clouds. Uh, some of them, again, were familiar with word clouds, but others were not. And they found uh, word clouds quite fascinating because they somehow um, bring out prominent themes. Um, some said, well, we can use it in the reading or we can use it in, in this or that. And these are some of the word clouds that the participants have shared. And you can see, of course, grammar seems to be, the word grammar seems to be prominent, but again, each one um, uh, is different. Uh, again, seeing how each teacher thought about uh, the whole experience of uh, reflecting and, and uh, and, and the whole experience of the grammar for TESOL session. Okay, so as I, as I said earlier, this was the very first time for me uh, creating and uh, moderating an EBU session, so I was quite a newbie there. Uh, but some ideas uh, worked for me, and uh, I thought maybe I can, I can talk a little, uh, a little bit about this, and hopefully this will benefit anyone who wants to, uh, to maybe join our team so first of all, uh, being and feeling confidently prepared. And I felt that um, um, the moderator training session, um, which was a, in uh, October and November, uh, it was a four week hands-on uh, workshop for EVO moderators and co-moderators. Um, I think it was a wonderful opportunity for me to, uh, to be and, and to feel prepared. Um, the, the session really, uh, did not leave any stone unturned, everything, uh, all the challenges and so on. So you could see um, everyone drawing on their experiences and sharing uh, possible uh, challenges and, and how to prepare for those and, and also successes and so on. And um, I, I, if uh, whoever wants to join, I, I would encourage you to um, take part uh, in that moderator training session and be actively uh, engaged in that session as well because there's a lot of learning there and of course um, having enough time to set up the syllabus um, for the EBO session with the guidance of um, everyone there um, uh, Nelly and Vance and uh, Natasa and everyone uh, were very 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 helpful um, the second thing um, I think that stood me in good stead was uh, to be flexible. I know when you said the, you work so hard on the syllabus and you said everything and um, you want to keep it that way because uh, you've worked uh, a lot on it, um, but it's, it's good as you start the session to, to make some adjustments uh, and redesign some of the session materials, depending of course, on the, the participants' uh, various teaching contexts, which you know of uh, after you start the session. And also be prepared to adjust the workload. So some, some participants are eager to participate in all the activities and some, and some don't have enough time. So um, it's good to give options. Um, and how do you know about this? Um, and I think that was because I was, uh, to some extent, virtually available um, and looking at the forums, um, responding to the forums, but also reading other participants' responses and so on. So this gives you the feel of um, what is it that maybe you need to adjust a little bit and so on. I also did a mid-session feedback towards the end of week two. Uh, most of the participants completed that maybe at the beginning of week three. And again, this was, this was quite uh, helpful in guiding me as to what is it that I needed to maybe adjust a little or change or uh, add things that would cater to the different teaching contexts and so on. The weekly synchronous meetings were, were a great opportunity for clarifications. So uh, even though not many uh, participants attended, but again, those who attended gave me ideas as to how maybe I needed to uh, tweak things a little bit and so on. The third uh, takeaway <laughs> is to uh, be uh, ready to step out of your comfort zone. So for me, hosting online meetings was a terrifying experience. It's like really <laughs> very terrifying. It used to be, not as much though. Um, my first attempt was um, not very, not very, um, I don't know, not, not the best. 
Um, even though uh, Nelly has kindly offered us a, a opportunities for practice to work with the WIS IQ, and I, and I practiced, I practiced, I practiced. But my first um, synchronous meeting, I, I was still like, uh, even now you could see like I'm, I'm still, I still need time uh, with screen sharing and whatnot, but I, I, I made it and uh, subsequent meetings were much more comfortable. So uh, be ready to expand your comfort zone. Not, not completely stepping out of it, but maybe just expanding it. Uh, number four, um, continually reflecting and thinking about the why as well as the how. So uh, anytime that, you, like there are a lot of online tools and, and platforms and so on that you can use, but uh, I think what, what really, um, again, helped me was to always think, why, why am I doing this? So this is the how, this is the what, and this is how I'm going to deliver it, but why, why, why is it there? Um, what I did was I, I created a document as a journal uh, for uh, all the reflections that I had as we were going along. So troubleshooting tips, <clears throat> um, reminders not to do for next time, and so on. So always reflecting what worked, what didn't, and so on. Um, I also uh, encouraged participants to reflect with me. So there were so many opportunities for sessions, uh, for the session participants to reflect on the concepts, on the practices, on the activities themselves uh, that we had in our session. Um, as I said, live meetings were um, a great venue for um, explaining uh, the how and articulating uh, the how, but also the why. So you, as you're trying to explain why we're doing this or that activity, it becomes clear to you and, and you either see, uh, yeah, that was, a good, that was a good decision to add or, or to add this or that activity or maybe not quite, maybe there are other possibilities and so on. Sharing the results of the surveys, as I said, proved very engaging and offered ample opportunity for reflection for myself and for, um, for the uh, participants and also creating weekly summaries. As you're creating the summary, you're, you're looking back all the time. And, and it's, it's not much the experience as much as thinking about the experience that I felt uh, really mattered. Finally, um, when, when, as I was preparing for the, for the session, I thought maybe I need to, to read all that was written on, on, uh, on grammar and, and all the different theories and update my, my research and, and so on. And I felt, um, like after the, the session was over that I didn't really like, it's good to be of course well informed and, and update uh, your knowledge of research and so on, but it all comes down to practice. And um, teachers uh, take that uh, theoretical and, and um, sort of knowledge and, and try to see how it fits into, into their context and that what really matters. And, as a moderator, I didn't have to know all the answers. I didn't have to, uh, to have everything sort of um, set in stone and um, answer all the, the questions and so on. So I accepted all the it depends and, and the maybes. And uh, it was good to even raise more questions. And it's okay if those questions remained, uh, remained unanswered. And uh, just to end, uh, this is one of, the, one of um, my session participants um, comments and I'm just going to uh, to read it with you because uh, for me it felt um, at the end that I have to some extent achieved uh, the purpose of Grammar for TESOL. So Manos, one of my uh, participants said this course surely provided us with a lot of opportunities to reflect on what we already knew about, what we already knew but also presented us different approaches to the same question. How should we teach grammar? Personally, I believe I'm left with more questions than I had before we started, which is great. <laughs> it is a great chance for me and many of us, I'm sure, to do some research on grammar teaching approaches, maybe lead a study or two, and figure out an optimal way to teach grammar. I believe that the basis of this course was that grammar teaching is not something written in stone. Therefore, maybe we all need to keep our eyes and ears open to other views and to be able to reevaluate the methods we already use. So, there you have it. Thank you very much for listening, and I look forward to EVO 2020. Okay, that's it. I can, maybe I can stop the sharing now. Yeah, well done. I, I remember when you were starting out, you were always seemed to be struggling, but keeping your head above water, you know, and yeah, and just yeah. keeping up there and keeping going. So, does anybody have any questions for Nagla?
How many people do we have here now? We um, have 30. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Well, we still have the attention of our audience. Okay. Well, just one question, Nagla. What did you learn about your subject matter that you didn't know before as a result of teaching this course? I think what was, um, for me, um, looking at, like, again, as I said, my experience is mostly in EAP. So, um, and again, a lot of my colleagues are in EAP and, and so on. So for me to be interacting um, and uh, exchanging views and ideas with, with uh, teachers from a wide variety of, uh, of contexts, it, it just taught me that context comes first and it's all about the learner needs and it's all about uh, the, the teaching context that, uh, that really matters. And, and this affects our, our, our teaching and teaching decisions. And so when it comes to grammar and other aspects of the language. Okay, well, thank you very much. Anybody else? And we have two more presenters. And I suppose uh, Heike was scheduled to go a little bit earlier. So maybe, I don't know, shall we? Heike, would you like to talk about immersive language learning? Yes, there you are. Thank you so much. Okay, and then Judy after that, Judy and Nevis Torres. And we'll just Wonderful. stay here. We'll just stay here until you're done. It's just all very interesting. Thank you very much. Well, Michael. thank you for taking me in anyway. Because <laughs> normally if somebody's late, it should be, it should be punished. Yeah. Later, later for that. <laughs> okay. So, so thank you very much for um, yeah allowing me to present our Evo session immersive language learning, attended to by 150 participants. Um, we spent five weeks uh, with one big question in mind: uh, what kind of language learning environment, an immersive language learning environment? We're talking about 3D type of virtual worlds, social VR worlds, or anything immersive, uh, which type of environment would warrant our time of investment and interest to get to know it deeper? Because there's so many out there. So we wanted to have a look at all of them and check them out and see um, which ones would we like best for language teaching and learning, obviously. So we set out with eight moderators, um, a wonderful team. As you can see, we are around in avatars. Uh, our participants spread all over the world, 150 of them. And uh, we um, decided to have a look at various platforms. Actually, the eight moderators were just a smaller version of it because we conducted 20 live sessions over a period of five weeks. And we invited quite a few experts of various virtual environments. And uh, for example, we looked at World of Warcraft and invited Dr. Cynthia Cologne because she's an expert on World of Warcraft. Or I contacted Co-Spaces in Munich and uh, in order to sort of, sort of um, ask them, can we have a demo? Because we wanted to get to know Co-Spaces. Um, we had somebody offered to do Immerse Online, a specific 3D VR enabled environment um, made and created for language learning. Fantastic. So there was quite a number of uh, solutions we looked at and it was a total of 18, which we discussed, and a total of 13, which we looked at in great detail. And uh, as I said, we invited people in Zoom guest speakers, experts, we invited them in Zoom, conducted the live sessions so that these experts of the, uh, say, World of Warcraft, showed us via screen sharing this world and told us a little bit about how to go about it, you know, what, what's the ins and outs of it. And then we compared the 13 <laughs> and we said um, this, set up this evaluation rubric, which became a very lengthy document because we wanted to find out in comparison which ones of these are free. So I'll let you read that real briefly before I start talking about it. 
and look at the evaluation that we uh, looked at. Is that its link under evaluation rubric factors? Yeah, and uh, I will paste all of the links in the text chat. I've already prepared them, if that's okay. Um, unfortunately, you can't click on here. No. Um, I should have given you the... <laughs> I'll do that. Um, uh, just after the session, I've prepared all of the links. So bear with me. So look at the evaluation rubric factors also um, in this case, if you could read that as well. Vance, you could also type that, I think, I'm from doing from... that now using all of my cool. thumbs. OK, yeah, D is that it? I and if it you in. could also type vlanguages.pbwiki, pbworks, sorry, vlanguages.pbworks.com, because all of the results of our session is on that very page. So wonderful. So what we looked at is um, which of these environments have voice, have text, are they free of charge? Uh, what do you need? Do you need a headset and all this? So we evaluated and looked at and compared, and then we voted for our top five. I'll give you the voting link as well in a minute. But if I gave that to you now, I would take away the uh, sort of excitement, which ones are the top five? So what I will do is I'll present in fast speed 19 solutions each with a slide, each with just one sentence to explain. And we count down from 19 to one. So the last five will be the, uh, six actually will be the exciting ones. So, but uh, just, just to get to know um, what we sort of, we call it the honorable mention, because it's a wonderful virtual world that we, uh, a lot of us enjoyed, a lot of educators were in there, and it, it was created by the creators of Second Life, sadly closed down in November last year, and our session was in January, remember? So here comes number 18. So I'm counting down from 18, you know, so 18. Sansar, um, a beautiful virtual world, but you can't do anything there. <laughs> Facebook Horizon, uh, that's sorry, that's actually wrong. That's Facebook Spaces, the predecessor of Facebook Horizon. Um, the wrong screenshots and uh, only accessible via Oculus Rift. Nobody has one, yeah, it's a headset. It's very expensive, yeah. Um, Facebook Horizon, now this is the one that is still beta, so we couldn't access it, yeah. And it will be a virtual world coming out beginning of this year they told us, with people who don't have legs. <laughs> I don't know what, what to make of this, you know. Uh, Fortnite, as you know, um, is being played by 230 million teenagers around the world. And they use voice over IP, usually via Discord. So they communicate about their gameplay in English. So they learn English. So we wanted to know. Um, can we use it for English language uh, teaching and learning? But we couldn't find anybody who would demonstrate that world to us. That's why it's on place 15, even though it's a very popular video game. Mozilla Hubs is the only one that runs in a browser. Now, I was told that now a couple of things are happening with Facebook coming out with Horizon that Microsoft announced that the latest version of Edge has a, a very newly developed WebGL. WebGL is the possibility of in the browser, in Edge or in Chrome, to display 3D content. And as you can see from Mozilla Hub, it's very, very basic at the moment. So if it was browser-based, we would possibly use more of it. However, there's a really nice community it's not really uh, good on, on 14, it should be higher up. Never mind, people don't know much about it. Play to Speak was um, a single player VR game. So it's, it's not really what we wanted to look at because we looked at social VR worlds. That means 
multiplayer games. That means when learners get together in that virtual world and interact and communicate. And so this was just the one off that we looked at, but what we liked about it was a, a beautiful chatbot, which caused us to talk a lot about chatbots. Yeah. And chatbots are a nice tool in, in OpenSim. So um, FriendBase was an app. So quite interested in all 3D content, even if it's just app uh, based, no PC content. And it's a lovely world. You can go in, create an account, it's all free, and you can start chatting with other people. Now, interestingly, it doesn't have a very good rating on Google Play. Uh, it only has a 3.3. Why? Because there's a lot of poor content. Poor as in um, bad language, sexual content, and even people talking to each other just for the sake of, you know, um, you know, getting a friend uh, thing. 3D has a long way from when I used to design 3D over the 30 years. Judy, you're right there. Judy, who's a Minecraft uh, person here, uh, will likely know what I'm talking about. So um, Immerse Online was that solution that we got to learn, a startup in the US, and they created um, an, a 3D environment, including content. And content means that for role play purposes, which is was the aim of the game here, uh, for role play purposes, there was even a transcript in English that helped learners to practice this role play with vocabulary and so forth. So an interesting 3D world, um, uh, absolutely unaffordable for any of us. And what we later on found out, it was not even a platform. It was a, a language learning school, more or less, that would sell via VR-based content. But it was interesting for us to see if we had tons of money, what would, would we create something like Immerse Online with beautiful content for English language learning? Yeah, so very good. It was a great demonstration by Lukas. Uh, now we're coming to 10. Uh, so Old Space is one of them. Um, Old Space has a fantastic community and the VR edu educators for VR community, which is very large, they tend to meet in Old Space. And um, even though I don't like the sticky, sticky <laughs> avatars, <laughs> stick as in they don't have hands or <laughs> they don't move, um, but it has great, um, there's voice over IP, it's a lovely text chat, and as I said, it's long standings, many, many years that's been around. So lots of ed, uh, communities have formed and it's great for language learning and teaching. Uh, runs on VR, but also runs on a browser. And VR chat really surprised us because we found that it's a, a hilarious 3D environment, which you can't do anything as regards customizing the environment. You know, you can't possibly build a house or anything, but you can change your avatar easily, easily and with a lot of fun. And there's lots of creative people in there who create the most funny of all avatars. And there's a lot of laughter. And interestingly, VR chat doesn't have a chat, no text chat. It only has voice. <laughs> we were kind of surprised at this. Science space, also beautiful, created by the founders of OpenSim. Um, uh, fantastic. They're coming out on beta after three years in May this year. Hopefully we're, we look forward to some more really, really um, fantastic educational content. Um, Verbila surprised us too. Didn't know about that one, that they created universities. <laughs> Their target group is really explicitly educational, but you can also be in teams, um, uh, corporate teams as well, you can do. And what is nice about Verbela is shared media on uh, what we would recognize as real sort of like normal whiteboard where you can present uh, uh, videos and PowerPoint and everything at ease. And this at ease doesn't take place in Second Life or OpenSim. So in OpenSim or Second Life, it's very difficult to present a normal PowerPoint. But here, it, this is was the, the USB of Verbila, uh, otherwise free to enter. 
and free to walk around and free to use some of the rooms. But if you wanted more, then you pay a lot of money. And now comes some number six. I think Minecraft should be higher than six, but there's not a lot of people who know about Minecraft. For me, it should be number two at least. <laughs> but there you go, it was six. And uh, we love Minecraft. We hear more from Vance about it. World of Warcraft beat Minecraft to it, but only because Cynthia <laughs> or Leah Lobo did a fantastic presentation on it, I'm sure. <laughs> so. Um, it is also interesting that World of Warcraft came out with a classic version just last year. And that's sort of the environment with role play that we could associate as educators with our learners. As a very, very strong educator community in World of Warcraft. And uh, as I said, it doesn't look like this monster type of thing. Yeah, so you can go for the classic version. Now, an absolute awesome, awesome, and I can recommend to everyone to get co-spaces. It's free for teachers and for 29 students. Uh, it's app-based. It can do AR, it can do VR, and it can do coding, all of it. And you must watch the recording of that session of a New Zealand teacher who showed us co-spaces, how he's been using that for three years with his um, learners. And it was adorable. Oh, we absolutely love co-spaces. Uh, number three, Second Life, classics. Yes, we love it. And interestingly, some Second Life has now changed a bit because they said, uh, am I out of time already, Vance? Give me a, 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 how many minutes? So number two, that's the important one. Yeah, yeah don't, don't stop now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, I'll be finished in two minutes. No, don't so worry. number two, <laughs> number two is um, Active Worlds, and because it's been around for many many years, and there's tons of content in Active World, it's free of charge. It's a beautiful environment to display text uh, for language learning. Absolutely adorable, and I think we would have voted Active Worlds to be number one except for one reason, I'll tell you in a minute who who, who beat everyone to it, um, because Active Words is easy to use, it can do voice over IP, it can do host hundreds of people, it, can, it is very, very, it's got tons of content, very easy to modulate and very easy to create. So Active Words is our number one with regards to usability. However, number one is OpenSim. And the only, re even though OpenSim is more difficult to handle, one of the reasons we voted it to be op um, number one is because it's open source, which means, say, if Active Worlds, which is a company behind Active Worlds, if the company folds and says, sorry, guys, uh, we have to close our business, then all of the worlds that were ever created in Active Worlds will disappear. Yeah, with OpenSim, sorry, with OpenSim, that does not happen because it's open source. It's out there. It's hosted by tons of people. So it will not disappear. Very important. It's like Moodle, you know, it's, it's very important. So here's our evaluation rubric. I'll share the links in a minute. Here's TriSider. And also with TriSider, it's beautiful. We add the pluses and minuses of each of the lessons, the languages, and that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay. Yes. Thank you very much, Heike. That was a very efficient and uh, uh, content-laden. Uh, Loved it, Heike. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Judy. Yes, thank you for sharing all the virtual worlds. Yeah. And you've given that presentation often in virtual worlds just recently. Yes. Mm -hmm. And left recordings. So, yeah. And, and here's another one. So, uh yeah, very interesting. It, you, that session really looks very interesting. Uh, unfortunately, we're so glommed into Minecraft where we are uh, that uh, we didn't look around and find all these other ones. But um, yeah, anybody but you else? You did the right thing because it's a uh, Minecraft warrants the time and effort to invest in it, mm -hmm. and that was mm -hmm. our purpose to find out which one, which ones of the worlds do we want to delve in. 
in great detail. And Minecraft is one of those that definitely is worth all the time and effort to get to know it. The thing I like about Minecraft, as opposed to Second Life, let's say, is that everyone is a maker. You know, that, that people, people can be creative in, in that world. They can do anything they want. Uh, of those other ones that you just showed us, are there any, like Open Sim, for example, can anybody create things there or do they just wander around and experience it? No, it's absolutely a, a, a creator's world. Uh -huh. And the whole of Open Sim, we had uh, four presenting uh, presentations on just what they did in Open Sim. Uh, it was four uh, language educators in our moderator team. And these presentations, they blew us away as to what not only the educators, but the students create in OpenSim. Absolutely mm. mind-blowing. The V Languages Wiki hosts a lot of pictures of student creations in OpenSim. Fantastic. Is there a video about it? Yes. <laughs> So th there are recordings there on the V Languages page, um, and there are in the second week. All we did was open sim, only second week, and there's to the um, uh, says we published pages of of pictures um, to look at. It, it's mind blowing what people are doing in open sim, and open sim used to be such a drab, as in it was so many years behind Second Life. That is no longer the case. Um, it's beautiful, it's rich in content, it's rich in, in teachers sharing it, and it's very, very affordable uh, for everyone who even wants to look at it. It's awesome. Okay, does anybody else have any comments they want to make or questions they want to ask? Hey, Dennis. <laughs> Great to see Osna. Yes, uh -huh. <laughs> Osna has been a wonderful supporter as a moderator. He's invited everyone to his session, <laughs> uh, to his place as well in Second Life. Dennis, do you want to say a word? That's unmute. Hit unmute, yeah, just hit find there. We have to Hi, help. Mike has brought me up well to mute most of the time. Yes, and but, people uh, here are very good about muting. This is amazing, yeah, yeah. amazing group of people here. No, great presentation. I, I waited outside in the corridor for a long time before I got in. Oh, sorry about that. That's my fault. I, no, no, no problem. But I, I just second everything Heike says, especially about open sim. I've just bought myself a tiny island there. So perhaps I'll see you there sometime. Okay, well, thank you very much. Okay, well, uh, we have one more group to present, Judy and uh, uh, Divas, Divas Torres, and they're going to tell us a, about teaching EFL to young learners. Hi, Divas hey, and Judy. Hey, I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, go for it. There you go. Hi, everybody. Um, in in proper New York fashion. I'm coming in a day late. <laughs> I, I totally messed up the time changes. <laughs> Didn't realize it was a day change too. Anyway, welcome, welcome. I'm glad to see everybody. It's really good to see everybody. Um, teaching EFL to young learners. We did again. We love doing that. Um, uh, this year, it was myself, Nelly Deutsch, Nives, who is here with us, um, Shelley, uh, Cheryl McCoy, and her daughter, Dina McCoy. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, so the first week that, you know, to begin with, like we target not just teachers. We like to think that we're target, targeting uh, parents, caregivers, um, uh, anybody children, teachers, anybody who actually deals with young learners. Um, so we had a five-week session. Um, I will talk to you about the first couple and um, then Nevis is going to pop in to talk about the last few. Um, anyway, we had uh, quite a number of people initially, about 150 signed up and um, you know they came and went and um, 
I think we had a really wonderful, wonderful, wonderful session. Um, we started with Nellie, who did our We're Getting Acquainted the first week, and she did a, a voice thread, which was a little interesting because a lot of people were new to it, so they were playing with it, and we, we played with it trying to use words, trying to use just pictures, trying to use text. It was, it was fun. Um, so we got to meet a lot of people from all over. Um, I think this year was a little more uh, mixed in the participants that we had. They came from all over pretty much equally, um, unlike last year where we had sort of a, a, an imbalance of mostly people from Vietnam. Um, so we go into the second week, which was my week. Uh, the Magic of Reading Aloud a Book, and I changed it up a little this year, and in the past we've done with just basically working on um, how to read aloud the book, and this year um, I added a major component where we discuss the science of reading and really what the science of reading um, is and the different components that um, come into play because I think all of the new research on the science of reading is really important because the truth is it's not inherent to what we do. It is something that we actually have to um, consciously um, pay attention to um, and learn. And I showed how reading aloud a book was very important in the science of reading and the in, and the necessity of the various components we need to do um, in the science of reading. And one of the biggest ones is having background knowledge and understanding, which is why a lot of students learn to sound out the words, they learn to read the words, but they have no idea what they're reading. And therefore, when they go on to trying to read on their own, it collapses on itself. So reading aloud is really important because you can read aloud a lot of different things to them. It does not necessarily, and this is one thing I think a lot of our participants learned, do not read what you think their reading level is. That is what they read. What you read is something that stretches what they are reaching for because that's the only way they're actually going to really learn to read on their own. Um, so we had a really good time and I, I like to think that um, I taught everybody to shine a little light on their children with the magic of reading a book. And I think we had a great time. Um, the participants really enjoyed really understanding that there is a little more to reading a book um, to the children or to adults or to anybody. Um, that's something else that they learned is that reading to adults can be just as exciting as reading to children. Um, and then we went into week three. Nevis, are you there? Can you unmute? Yes, done. Okay, so just uh, firstly, this is my fourth year presenting in the week, uh, well, in the board games because it changes from week three to week four depending on how many weeks we have um, with what we're planning. Uh, the important thing is to... Um, in about my week is the fact that we go over a lot of theory and then some practical activities with and again as Judy was saying every year we get different nationalities coming into our sessions which makes it challenging because every time um, we have to get over the language part first which sounds terrible but it's not really it's just because each one of us communicates differently um, so then it's, it's important to understand why games are important because then we get a lot of people that say, but why use games to learn English? How can you improve the uh, learning of a language by using games? So Judy's changed the uh, slide and that's exactly where I want to be. There are some benefits of using board games and this is what we go over in, our, in my week specifically, um, motivating the learning uh, sorry, board games motivates learning because it elicits 
uh, interaction with, ga with a game-based activity. You engage the learner because playing a game doesn't feel like schoolwork. You boost their language skills by naturally eliciting that interaction that can happen, especially the board game must be made, obviously, on a language basis. So that we help them create board games that are going to elicit the speaking. It's not just playing a game. It is playing a game, but eliciting that speech factor, that speaking the second language, which is important in the EFL classroom, which is what our... Um, what our session is all about. It promotes confidence, it boosts um, group socialization, allowing for communication. I'm looking at two slides. Okay, it's the same one, yes. Speaking skills and the role playing that happens as well when you're playing a game like a board game, how they uh, tend to be like if they're, winner, if they're winning or losing. And so the, that role playing, that interaction, that can also help shy students uh, overcome their shyness about speaking. Anyway, just to wrap up my week, and then we'll go on to the next slide. The important factors about my week from my past experience has been to make sure that the week is not as heavy as I made it. The very first time I did this week, I put in so many activities, I found that the participants were not able to complete the activities because I didn't think that they were, would only be doing my work. They had to do four weeks of other things in the whole session. So uh, this, this year I purposely just um, narrowed it down to the bare essentials and made it so that they were able to get through my week without that much of a problem. And I found them more excited uh, because we were getting a lot of repeaters in the past, people who were coming back the second year and third year because they were saying I couldn't finish it all last year or I didn't get enough out of it because I was doing it, I was doing the activities and rushed through the activities and wasn't, we weren't really learning. Uh, whereas this year I felt that we were getting more learning happening in the short, in the narrower uh, activity, like less activities rather than having too many activities. So um, that's what I found happened in my work. I just found that they were really brilliant because I gave them less activities to do. Um, okay, so that's about me. Let's go on to Cheryl's week. Next slide. Sorry. Thank you, Judy. So a little bit about Cheryl's week. Upcycling, just as she says on her slide, is a metaphor for way teachers always operate. They take an idea, a word, an object, and they use it to teach a lesson in a unique way. Um, Cheryl's session that she does together with her daughter, Dina, helps teachers to practice that process, to put that upcycling uh, process into actually learning lang a language. So they use activities um, such as um, uh, what are some of the activities? Well, they did, I think, um, a watermarking or something, was it? Do you remember, Judy, what it's called? I've forgotten the name. A, a tie-dye, that's it. They did a tie-dye activity where um, the activity went through all the steps and it, the activity being in English, and they and each of the participants had to redo that activity with, they could also do it with their class, with their students, if they happen to have students, which was really great. And, and that was where that um, whole activity of upcycling takes a new turn. The other thing that we noticed as well during Cheryl's uh, week was when we were talking about upcycling with some of our Italian uh, participants, they were really not understanding what upcycling was because upcycling is a new term and they were they were thinking upcycling was actually recycling and they were thinking, well, why do you want to do, why do you want to recycle? Like recycle in Italian means to take something and either, you know, separate it, plastic, paper, cardboard, etc., and put it in the separate recycle bins outside or um, or take something that you've used it, like use an old pot for 
carrying something else in it or you know what I mean they didn't really understand that upcycling was actually changing the destination of that object so it wasn't just using a pot and using it as a pot somewhere else like not just to put pot plates in but but changing the whole aspect of it so uh, that was really really interesting and that's where we learned how important sometimes the language is when you are in these sessions where each culture has an idea and a concept of the language. I'm Australian, which you can probably tell. Judy's from New York. Uh, Cheryl is from Kansas. Dr. Nelly's from Toronto. So we already have um, four different cultures around us, but we all in, we, we're all English speakers. So more or less we understand or can um, make space for each one's culture. But when we deal with someone else's culture someone else is learning english as a second language that was that is for us always a big learning um, curve that we need to always uh, understand and i think that's the best thing about evo evo is allowing us each one of us to reach beyond our cultural borders and beyond sometimes our own cultural bias because being native english speakers we sometimes can't understand what our students don't understand when it's to us simple English, but it's not because as upcycling showed us, it was like another whole new world. So um, to wrap it up, I think the EVO sessions are really important and they need to be on the mark all the time. Um, they should never deviate from what it starts off to be. That's all from me here in Italy. Over to you, Judy. So, yeah, um, we, uh, in the end, uh, for week five, our participants, they had their challenges, they did their activities, they learned a lot of methods of teaching, they learned about reading aloud, the pluses, the minuses, and what are the best ways to do it. We played enormous amounts of games, that was really awesome. Uh, we learned about arts and crafts from Cheryl, and we created videos for storytelling board games and made arts and crafts. And then we had this uh, Padlet that we had our students post their um, finished things and their re um, reviews and their reflections on what they did. And I think everybody had a really wonderful, positive time. They really enjoyed discussing the uh, science of reading and really learning really what it was all about because we hear it a lot, but you know, a lot of people didn't really know what it truly was about. So that was kind of cool. Um, and as everybody knows, I always give you a, a comment and a quote. So here it is. Creativity is intelligence, having fun. Albert Einstein, and to practice any art, no matter how badly well or badly is a way to make your soul grow. So just do it by Kurt Vonnegut. So everybody have a great, great, great day. I decided for my, video, for my video, I would put a picture of what New York looks like right now behind me at my balcony door. <laughs> it's like Sunday every day, <laughs> but it's cool. It's cool. And it's great to see everybody. Any questions? Yes, Heike has a question. Sure, Heike, what's up? You want well, to put your mic um, the, the question was, um, did, you, did you share um, know-how and best practice about how to teach young learners online as well? Or was it more that you, as teachers, shared best practice of what you do locally? Um, well, I think for me, I know, um, I did a little of both. So it's like we talked about what face-to-face -face reading a book out loud is and the benefits and the drawbacks. And we talked about like doing it online, creating how would we create a video of an online story and what are the actual drawbacks to that? And there are a few drawbacks to that, which makes that kind of reading face-to-face -face a little more um, useful and effective. Um, because like when they, you know, there's all these storybook online and stuff, which I know about because it's my union. But um, the drawback of the online storybook reading is that 
you're not really teaching the kids to read a book and you're not getting them excited about reading books. Because one of the biggest challenges we, we encountered um, that was brought up over and over and over again, and it is every year, is that my teachers are always like, well, my kids hate reading. They hate books. How do we get them to love books? They said, well, you know, the thing is, if you keep equating books with school and not equating books with something you love to do or something that's fun to do or that has a value, they're not going to. Because as they go along and they finally learn how to read it, it's going to be like, oh, yeah, I got to read this for school. Um, and they don't understand that you can just read it for fun which is why I stress, try not to read readers to them, read real books. Um, and, you know, like a lot of the teachers were like, oh, you can't, you know, do it if they don't have pictures, but you can, and the, and the kids love it. So, um, but yeah, we also discussed online, and I, I believe Mavis also discussed online. Because um, I'm, I'm getting yeah. a lot of requests from teachers now who want to know how to teach a kid online. Yeah, <laughs> and, uh, I know. I'm wondering where to turn to. I was really looking forward to your presentation today because um, I don't, I'm not familiar with that. Well, being that, that, that this I'm happened not. before COVID virus. I know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no. yeah. Um, but I, I, I am, I, I am also, excuse me, I am no. also a tutor and a train and an IT, IT, uh, I have an IT company and a teacher trainer. So actually, since the virus thing started and they kicked all the teachers in New York out of their classrooms, my business has been exploding because I've been online. I've been, you know, doing one-on-one -on -one teaching with all of these teachers to teach them how to use the the technology and how to reach the children online. So yes, it's happening, but maybe next year. <laughs> Yeah, well, I just I just wanted to say to Heike just quickly that um, although the material, when we did have our session, we always talk about teaching online, but most of the teachers and 99% of the teachers do, are not interested about, they were not interested about practices of teaching children online because as most teachers that teach face-to-face -face in a normal classroom, they were never thinking that they would be in the situation that they are now. Yeah. And now we've had to revert all our high schools. I work at a high school full time. Everyone has gone online. I spend all my afternoons until I work 18 hours a day teaching Italian teachers that are in our small community how to revert to online teaching. It's been very hard because most of them assume that what you do face to face, you just do it online, but it's not. And the students are falling asleep or they're not answering or they're not listening and they're not being, they're not um, interacting with the teacher in the classroom. And we've had a, a very, very difficult time uh, teaching teachers to change their outlook of teaching online because it's a totally different thing and really it's not just about best practices for teaching children the, the important thing is that in Italy we have very strict uh, a very strict um, privacy act in uh, operation since 2017 and um, oh, okay so great uh, now I can see the Italian Ministry of Education is one of your um, uh, Okay, all right. So basically, I'll get to you. I'll get back to you. I'll write to you on that. Um, basically, our imp the important thing at the moment is that they understand that the GDPR, uh, GDPR of 2017 really does limit what we do online. We can't mention their names if we're going to record. Uh, teachers are recording lessons now because Meet, for example, everyone's using Google Meet because of G Suite apps, right? Everyone's got the G Suite now. You know, the, even schools that didn't have it are now have, and now have now got it. And they're recording and they're publishing it and they're not aware of the fact that students should not be students under 18 cannot be filmed right. uh, and you know and shown on uh, public channels so it's becoming really 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 difficult it's really difficult but uh, we're getting there we've got a lot of we're, we're working very hard every day with the italian teachers and it's just a matter of teamwork and helping out and working. That's it. 
a lot of work. Hi, Vance. How are you? What time is it down there or up there, wherever you are? Oh, it's tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Already. Yeah, which is why I got confused. I thought, yeah. I thought when he said Saturday, I went, oh, okay. And I looked at him and went, oh, it's Saturday night. And then, and then, and then this morning, because my phone was on, on mute, it was like I woke up to a, a rash of nonstop <laughs> messages. I was like, oh, my God, it was the wrong day. <laughs> no. But yeah, yeah no, no, I mean, even, yeah. mm -hmm. even in New York, with a lot of the teachers that I'm finding that their biggest issues are, especially because we have so many privacy rules in the, in, especially in the public school system, which is the one that I deal with mostly. They don't understand, understand how to password protect things. They don't, you know, they're, they're going on Zooms, they're going on platforms and not realizing how to privacy you know, put it into private settings and lock it down so that only the children can see it, only they can see it. And that, you know, because, and, it, and it's a new thing for them because none of these teachers, most of them are young early service teachers have never been online before and are completely clueless. So it, it's been a little crazy, you know. Yeah, there's a lot of resources um, free free resources out there right now, and um, and I see a lot of teachers using Flipgrid for kids. Well, the reason why I said that is because I see a lot of posts on, you know, their their faces of kids of um, that have recorded um, yeah, on and, Flipgrid, and they have to teach. The other issues that I've been dealing with is like they need to teach the children netiquette um because the children don't know it most of the time that so and then there's the issues of some of the children don't actually have internet access so they're not just they're just plain not getting educated right now mm -hmm. which is really sad mm -hmm. um and we're talking about the invisible population of refugees immigrant children in homeless shelters um families of uh trauma who are in undisclosed housing, and those places don't have internet access. They don't have phones, and those kids are just not getting educated, which is pretty sad. Um, so we're trying to address that and in a non-tech way too. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I hope everybody's well and yeah. staying staying Good healthy. Part. Yeah. <laughs> staying, yeah. Stay well, stay healthy, yes. stay inside, <laughs> and stay away. <laughs> ah, well, yes. Yeah. In my, house, in my house, it's been really rough because I have my, my youngest adult son who's, who's in a, a theater conservatory. He's been kicked out, and he's online, and he's, like, confused, so I had to teach him a little bit. Unfortunately, my husband is still going to work because he's a doctor, and they're not closing his clinic, but... Mm. Um, so he's still out there, which is kind of scary every day, but, mm. um, you know. Stay safe. Yep. One day at a time. We've been through a lot. We'll be through some more, and we'll survive this one, too. <laughs> yes. Martha's out of quarantine. Congratulations. Yay! <laughs> um, yeah, well, I'm sure you, it's not safe to go out just because you you know, you, well, anyway, <laughs> you well, go outside, you, know, actually, you it's sort of It's sort of weird because in Manhattan, where I am in Midtown Manhattan in the theater district, it's actually not that bad. It's worse in the outer boroughs where there's the density of population and everything. But pretty much people in Manhattan, transients and, and, and newcomers all split town. And some of the rich people split town. So it's really quiet. It's, it really is like Sunday morning, dead quiet and deserted only it's kind of weird because it's 24 7. <laughs> so um and and aside from crazy people who are having neuroses over toilet paper i mean things are okay <laughs> you know our our distribution channels are still open and so we still get goods and it's not really that bad um you know we'll we'll survive this too one day at a time you know, Vance, is, as, as us older people know, we, we've been through a lot of other things. <laughs> we'll be through yeah. this too, you know. 
Thank you, uh, Heike, for mentioning Talon. This is a... Uh, I love your groups, Heike. That was great. Yeah, this was uh, just, you know, people like yourselves and just people all over the place are, um, you know, in this, well, Talon stands for Teaching and Learning in Isolation. Yeah, this, there we go. Should be something like that, maybe. Okay, so there it is. And it's just a, it's an, it, the, um, it's under the learning together umbrella. So it sort of segs with learning together, but it's for people who uh, are finding themselves in having to learn, having to retool, you know, their, their mentality and, or just getting like Michael Coughlin, one of my good old, good friends, he just was feeling lonely. So he, that's actually comes the impetus for it was he, he, he wanted to revive webheads, which I used to, we did 20 years ago. And, Bang! We, all of a sudden, we got all these faces in Zoom, but it's just people that uh, you know. It, it, well, the, the way it works is you go to the tiny URL there, and you can ask, to, you can request access to it. And uh, sorry, my microphone was over there. Um, and then you can, it's got a schedule, and you can write yourself in. And since I'm available uh, from you know 12 hours a day from. 10 in the morning, let's say, give, give me a chance to get a cup of coffee. And then, well, earlier than now, but 10 at night, I can get started. So at any time in there, that's, that's a 2 a.m. to 1400. Um, I don't mind knocking off. I'm not going anywhere. So I don't mind taking time and putting on a Zoom session. So if you want to propose one, just go to that, uh, that page and uh, Put yourself down and right now Lane Marshall is there for the 14th I, oh no I don't I haven't put her in yet she's in learning together but she's uh, she offered to come in and talk about uh, one of her initiatives as well and we're gonna meet on uh, uh, Monday I think uh, but anyway you, you see the schedule there and if you and we're just getting it started but if you you know want to share anything uh, skill and you want to talk about uh, uh, issues with children or uh, the, the things you've been talking about here, uh, you can just go and sign yourself up if you just want to, you know, I think we're going to intensify a little bit our, our online uh, interactions. So there's also a Facebook page, as you saw. So and, um, Vance, you should, you should add to it, only evil moderators are invited. <laughs> no way. <laughs> no, evil is another part of it. Well, it's such a wonderful group of moderators out there, and it's a huge crowd already, and they're the best on the best. Yeah. <laughs> so you should you should limit your invitation circle <laughs> of Tallinn to this exclusive no, group. Any, anybody, anybody, <laughs> we want we want to hear. You know, actually, it would be nice to hear from participants. You know, the, uh, of course. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Honestly. Yeah. <laughs> So well, anyway, on I guess on that note, let's uh, say good night. But uh, a little outro, maybe. Uh, it's uh, it, it used to be the fourth of April, but now it's the fifth. But uh, it's <laughs> <laughs> it, we started on the fourth, and uh, this is learning together. It's a webcastathon weekend. Uh, yesterday yeah. and today, we've had three over two hour sessions, and um, it's. Learning Together, episode four, four or five. So, all, and it's all put into one uh, place. There's a link up there somewhere. You'll find a link in the text chat. Oh, I should give it to you, I suppose. Or does, do you need the link? Do you need the link to the, or just go to learningtogether.com. Uh, sorry, learningtogether.net. And you don't really need the long link. Vance? Mm -hmm. Vance? Yes? Why don't you mention the Tech Guru Bar? And the tools and the outreach. Christine, please mention the Tech Guru Bar and the tools and the outreach. <laughs> That's Christine Saba. Yes. <laughs> well, I think there's probably links. The Tech Guru Bar is, is something with the TESOL. Uh, it's a TESOL initiative. You know, they were going to revamp. Uh, Christine would be best. But she's the chair of the call interest section. So if you want to say something about it, but basically we're asked to re- think the electronic village uh, and the tech guru bar was something they came up with. And so um, they, um, 
there, it's supposed to be kind of the idea is there's a bar with a tech guru there all the time and it's sort of manned and it's also a resource center. So I was uh, bummed we didn't have it. <laughs> yeah, techguru.bar.pbworks.com is where Sandy Wagner has set it up. Now, uh, in conversations with these people, I got a really neat idea. And uh, Heike's here, I'll run this fire. But I thought, gosh, that would it'd be nice to have one. As we're doing it online, you know, and PB Works is okay, but what about in Second Life? Uh, maybe we could have a tech guru bar in Second Life. Of course, I don't know. Maybe <laughs> Heike could help with that or something like that. But or, oh, or provide us a space. So. <laughs> hmm? I'll book a whole sim for us. <laughs> it could be. No, it could so. be in. Uh, <laughs> what's the the last one you showed us? Is something sim? Open like, sim. Open yes. sim. Yeah, I know open that. Open sim. Yes. Well, we, yeah, we could do it in open sim or something like that. Why not? That's an idea. So cool. have a have a physical space you can go into. Um, I suggest Minecraft, but people might get frustrated. They get slain and they lose all their inventory. You know. Anyway, but. Um, yeah, so I, that's just thinking, I mean, now that this is over, and once I get a little sleep, I'll probably be looking for something else to do. And so <laughs> this is a good month for it, you know, or six, two months or three months, however long it lasts, it'd be a nice uh, thing to play around with, you know. To, so that's, that's an idea I had for it. Did I cover all the bases, Christine? We saw your video a minute ago. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, Tom Rob, it was Tom Rob's idea. You had mentioned Sandy. Sandy was um, Sandy, helping yeah. out, but it was Tom Rob's idea to come yeah. up with the tech grow bar, All and right. then to mm -hmm. the, do the outreach to the whole community. Given the situation um, is a global issue nowadays, so we just thought we'd be out there to help anyone. As you've been mentioning, you've all been mm -hmm. called upon to help out. Mm -hmm. So there's that also yeah I've got a another uh, URL that I've been the, the tech guru bar is, and I think Tom also has another uh, initiative there are a lot of people who are making resource pages TESOL um, TESOL has a COVID-19 uh, community so in fact, actually you can, you don't have to be a TESOL member to join it. It's got a lot of good resources. Uh, you can apply to TESOL to get a TESOL ID, you don't have to pay for it. it but anyway, and then, then you can join that community and see what they're doing. But I'll just put another link here as to a, a page. My idea is that I would crowdsource a page. I got that idea from Alec Kuros, by the way, uh, George Kuros's brother, uh, because a, he had some 20 years ago he had the idea of crowdsource google docs and get people to write and collect information that way and they often work so i thought I, i've got a, a little resource too uh but i thought i would curate it by getting people to write in to this document so you can have a look at it if you want i'll just find it give me a second here oh where is it by the way, I posted mm -hmm. links to the Call IS help uh, page, Call IS tech resource help sheet. Mm -hmm. It's Call IS app help. Yeah, okay. Here it is, cross document. Uh, it has a tiny URL, which I, I don't know why I can't always remember my tiny URLs. Uh, here it is, COVID-19 teaching, that's it, okay. So this is a place you can visit. I, I've, been, I've been putting a lot of information there. And I, there's a uh, wiki page that it goes to. Oh, here, I'll just include that in the link here. So the wiki page is the second thing down here. So I'm taking the information from this and curating it there. But I've been so busy with this the last week or so, I haven't really done much with it in the last week. Now I've got to find my Zoom chat. Here we go. OK. There we go. So that's. Uh, COVID-19 teaching. That's a crowdsourced document. If you want to go there, you can explore it. It's got some interesting I, things there. I think you pasted it to someone's private chat. I did. <laughs> oh, that's, that's, thank you for uh, yeah, no telling what I've been doing. I, that, that's one thing I really don't like about the Zoom thing. Is it always defaults to the last person you communicate with. Right. And I think they're doing that. Thank you. <laughs> did everybody get the link to the... Everyone got the Talon link? And uh, I that everybody 
Uh, I hope so. Anyway, okay. So There's just a few things I've been playing around with. I've been fantastic ve vegetating here at home. Okay, well, um, thank you all for coming. This is really such a rich, interesting group that we have here. The people who moderate these Evo sessions, selflessly, I should say, and um, and uh, as Stephen Downs uh, famously said when he put on the first MOOC, and people were thinking, he, everyone was thinking they were crazy. Uh, George Siemens and Stephen Downs were giving a course very simply just for a couple hundred students. They just said, yeah, why don't we open this up for everybody? And, you know, okay, what a neat idea. Thousands of people register for their course and it. All of a sudden, they got to figure out how, you know, okay, we, we, we have to teach these people who paid for it. Okay, that's fine. But how are we going to deal with all these other people? And so they invented the concept of MOOC, which they didn't invent it. It just happened, you know. But it is that people come into it and you don't have to feel the teacher doesn't feel responsible for them. He's a facilitator. And basically, they teach themselves. But when uh, they were trying to work all that out, and someone asked uh, Stephen Downs, "Why did you? Why are you uh, flogging yourself on the back and doing this?" You know, he said, "Because I'll learn from it." You know, that's basically what we're doing. That's why I asked Nagala what she learned from her experience, because that's, that's really what we're doing. We're learning all the time. We're, we're upping our skills uh, through EVO and through all these uh, interactions with one another and all these networks. So anyway, well, thank you all for coming, and um, get some sleep, Vance. <laughs> do you, the, so what I look we like should I need do, it? what we should do at the very end is everybody switch on webcams and clap. <laughs> Yay. Okay, yes. Wait, okay. Oh, keep, great, great, great keep help. Us. Keep it up. I'm doing, the, I'm doing the screenshot. Okay. Yay! I got it. All right. This is kind of like every night at seven o'clock promptly in New York. Now they clap for all of the health they clap work. for several. So my minutes, husband goes yeah. out to the balcony and he goes. <laughs> nice. Okay, that'll go up in my blog. Everyone's clapping but me. I'm, you know, working with this. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll have to Photoshop it in. <laughs> okay. Ciao, everyone. Then. Okay. Um, Thank you, everyone. Nice, Thank nice you. Thing, you know. Ciao. Stay Bye. safe, as everyone saying. Stay safe. Party yes. From Italy. Bye. 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 Okay. Bye. 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 See you. I'm waiting for my uh, screen share to upload. Oh, here. I'll just give you the link. And uh, stop the recording. I, I will in a minute. Oh, that? did someone do that? No, that was me. I, no. I, I was just going to put the link to everyone clapping. I thought it would be kind of fun. There. Thank you. Thank you. Thank there you, we go. Judy. Thank bye, bye. bye. There we go. Bye, link to everyone clapping. Okay. Bye-bye. <laughs> bye. Bye. I clicked on recording, nothing happened. Of course, I got to go to more and stop recording.